to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, welcome everybody. Um, our first order of business today is to approve our minutes. And this was um, our last meeting that we held up in Kalispell and um, was back in May 13th. So has everyone had a chance to look those over? Yes. Jody? Yes, I have. Liz, that was your first meeting, Liz. So um, do we have any discussion about those minutes? Any discussion or changes? Okay, seeing none, um, would uh, one of the board members like to make a motion? Yep, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, I move that the board approve the uh, May 13th Kalispell meeting minutes as read. Okay, I need a second. Chair Kip, I second that motion. Thank you, um, Member McLean. Um, let's vote on that motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Um, any opposed say nay. Okay. Um, hearing none, that motion is approved uh, four to zero. Our next order of business is uh, just reports from our um, board members. And uh, what I'd like to do is just start with district one. Uh, we'll put Jody on the spot. Um, Jody, would you, uh, do you have anything you'd like to share with our board? Oh, sure. Well, um, yeah, as the board's aware of, uh, District 1 is very busy. We have a lot of water, a lot of mountains, and a lot of people. And um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, let's see at uh, Lake five, which is about 30 miles northeast of Kalispell, uh, the fishing access site there um, received an offer of a donation of four acres of property adjacent to uh, Paul's Memorial fishing access site. So this would increase this site's uh, footprint to 14 acres. Um, so that um, is now out. Um, the environmental assessment is now out for public comment. Um, I think it's been up for about a week and a half. So um, that's positive. That would be a, a nice addition if that were to be added to that area. <clears throat> um, at Milltown State Park, uh, the uh, folks there are looking at, uh, they're working with Montana Rail Link and other folks to open up that access um, that we've talked about before. It'd be at the south end on the Clark Fork there uh, where that park comes down adjacent to the interstate. And this is kind of a neat, it would be a really neat feature on um, the parking area there. Um, it's kind of against the, uh, the bank of the interstate. And then you, you would go down and actually underneath an old railroad tunnel underneath the interstate and it would open up to the river bank. And it's probably would open up access to probably a third of a mile, I'm, I'm somewhere in there. It's a pretty substantial part of Riverbank that would be accessible to the public. Um, so that's been in the works for a while, um, but it sounds like things are moving moving well in the right direction. Um, they're looking actually at design and construction. They have to make sure that it's safe and a nice pathway for folks. But um, um, and then also in in the um, Missoula area. Um, the manager there is, has a, uh, a river ambassador program that's in effect. And this is, it's been in effect for two years now. And this engages with like, oh, maybe local groups, um, the city of Missoula, uh, county of Missoula, and they work with the Clark Fork Coalition. Um, and it actually hires people, people to help folks get off and on the river. Um, it helps with 
Um, they shuttle people to the river as they float down. So it's kind of focused in the highly congested areas. Um, the way I understand it is these ambassadors may work on and off the water. And so I know that staffing can be an issue in the summer. Um, it's a very, very busy area. So this definitely helps out uh, the folks manage that park. I've, I've visited this area, um, some of these areas where people want to just hit the water in the hot summer and it is unbelievably busy. But um, I applaud the, um, the folks there that are working on this because um, they do the best they can to just keep people moving, keep the park active, get as many people on as they can. And so um, it's a great, it's a great program. And I think they're looking to expand it. Um, I know that the Blackfoot River area is getting very busy. Um, the float in, they've got some float in sites along there. I think there's eight float in sites. Um, this is just outside of Missoula between Missoula and Clearwater Junction. Um, and uh, so that's a, that's a good tool that they have and that things are moving, moving along well there. Um, also, um, FWP's teamed up with uh, the Montana State Parks P Foundation um, to, uh, that will provide a new all abilities dock at Frenchtown State Park just outside of Missoula. Um, that is on site and should be installed um, this next season. Um, in the same area um, at uh, Fort Owen, I know we've talked a lot about Fort Owen in the past. Um, the uh, the new interp interpretive work is complete, and that has been funded by uh, the Helmsley Family Foundation, along with um, Montana State Parks Foundation. So definitely um, thanks to them for their donation and uh, Montana State Parks for, for working with that. Um, and also update on the, on the structures at Fort Owen, um, the first phase of the restoration work that's been uh, on the foundation of the barracks there um, is completed. And it sounds like that was very educational to the folks working on it. So um, they have a, a direction to go for the next phase, which will be starting in, in 2023. Um, as you can imagine, when you remove, carefully remove uh, material away from the foundation of this very, very old building, you're kind of nervous on what you might find. Um, and it sounds like things went well. Um, and, and Fort Owen is, is looking real good. And um, so um, let's see. Um, I sent out some information to the board about uh, the advisory committee meeting that I attended at Placid Lake State Park and that Owl Creek area. Um, it was nice to get together with uh, folks from the advisory committee and see that they get exposed to some of our parks issues and things that we look at. Um, and um, one of the takeaways for me from that is, is that in the Owl Creek area, I think if you folks remember, um, Beth Shoemate has talked about it a couple times where just outside of Placid State Park, there's um, the road going into that goes through Nature Conservancy land. And a lot of people are just camping along the road there and they can't find a spot to camp. And it causes some issues with um, all their, they, they go into the park and they use the facilities there. They dump their trash, um, the showers and that kind of stuff. So the agency has been working with the Nature Conservancy, um, trying to um, see what, what we could do there, maybe, there would be some, we could allow some maybe remote camping, um, dispersed camping on that land going in, but rather than just have it be like a free for all, kind of have a, uh, have it be managed. So there was um, a survey that was put out to the public um, last fall, um, looking for information, what the public would like to see done with that area. And we don't have final results from that yet, but when we do get those, I'll certainly pass those along. Um, and also when we were in that area, uh, we took a look at, uh, the Clearwater Junction, uh, the fishing access site there, and there's a, a portion of land on the other side of the fishing access 
that is used for kind of remote camping, the same kind of scenario there. And they're, they're looking at possibly maybe designating some sites. There's still kind of that rustic designation, unimproved, but possibly fire pits and actual, um, actual parking spots for folks there, which would be nice that the area is very popular, a lot of fishing, that kind of thing. Um, one thing that, uh, that some of the managers brought up at the, at, uh, that meeting that we were at on site there is they're trying to look at these a couple of these areas of more holistic view, meaning that, you know, you've kind of got like so if you took that Placid, Placid Lake area, for example, it's a very well manicured site. It's a hundred percent reserved and just right across the street, you've got folks that are just showing up and remote camping. And then you've got, and, and just the contrast in the area, it's so different, just a couple miles away. There's a wildlife management areas. You have a state park site, some forest service land. And so I, it seems like a kind of a, a management um, way to view things is kind of look at things as a whole. So, and that is also, they're kind of looking at that approach in the Fish Creek drainage area as well. You've got state park lands mixed with wildlife management areas, fishing access sites, DNRC land, they're trying to kind of look at things as just a picture, not just a little tiny chunk of now you're inside the park boundary, it's this, it's kind of a, recreation over the landscape um and last is that um this wonderful winter weather we're having i would i'm glad to hear that um the fwp's grooming program is up and running the snowmobile grooming program um chairman kip i know you've been pretty involved with that um over the past years and snowmobiling activities um in uh oh north in region one i got a note from the manager there that they're up and running they've got in three counties they work with seven different groups and are grooming over 600 miles of trails um and i know that this program uh this the grooming program through fwp uh grooms over 4,000 miles of trail um, every season so um I heard some from some friends in West Yellowstone and they haven't seen this much uh, snow this early since the 90s. So things are looking great there. And um, so just a great program that, and my hat's off to the uh, snowmobile program managers. And that wraps it up, Chairman Kip. Okay, uh, thank you, Jody. Uh, Scott, glad to see you. Good, hello everyone. Okay. Um, I'll go to district. Hi, Vice two. Chair That's... Brown. I'm sorry to interrupt. Could we just confirm that you can hear and see us now? I, I can hear and see you. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, District 2, that's me for a report. Um, attended Bannock Days, the third Saturday and Sunday in July. Um, they were nearly back to the numbers they had pre pandemic. They had a, a 2,500, 3,000 people attend. A little later in the summer, made a trip over and uh, camped at Lost Creek Campground. This is a real sleeper if you haven't been there. It's tucked away up in a nice little canyon, uh, just beautiful, and a waterfall right at the head of the campground. Easy access, um, you know, not even a hundred yards from where you can park and walk up to the campground. The Anaconda Smokestack is a, another state park that's there. We saw that we went over to Granite and uh, that's a bit of a challenge getting up into there. Um, pretty um, uh, more of a an ATV uh, four wheel drive road, but um, that was interesting. Um, at some point, I think we, the board would like to visit a little bit about that and understand more of it's a ghost town, but we have just a small little portion of it as a state park. Um, the, in Dillon, there's a Cornell Park is a 
sportsmen's or fishing spot on the river. The Trails Coalition from Dillon owned that and they donated that to the Fish and Game. Uh, Cornell Park needs some TLC and the Fish and Game will do that. They'll go in, clean it up, new picnic tables, pit toilets, and a new boat ramp in there. So excited about that. Um, just uh, a couple weeks ago, they were filming an episode of 1883 in Bannock. And um, what a production, you know, 300, 350 people um, down in there between the workers and the um, just everything that was going on, the food service on and on. Um, they were in there for a few days. They'd done quite a bit of work on um, some of the old buildings and fences to tune them up to make them just perfect to match the other things that were in there. And it's my understanding that they leave those things there when they um, when they were done. And um, we've been grooming trails here, uh, Scott, for about um, two weeks. So we've got real good snow. And um, that's basically what's happening in uh, District 2. Um, Liz, do you have anything uh, for District 3? I don't have a lot. I did attend the CAC meeting last week. It was the best three and a half hours of my week. <laughs> but it was really good to hear the, the legislative update and specifically to hear from all the different um, members of that committee. I'm not sure if other committees are as large as this one is. There are about 23 representatives there. Um, hearing about some of the concerns that are going around uh, regarding the upcoming legislative session that I see we're going to be talking about, but that's all I have. Okay. Oh, on a personal side note, my um, daughter got engaged in a state park here in Great Falls earlier. So that was kind of fun <laughs> out at Giant Springs. So oh, that's a beautiful place. Okay. Um, uh, District four, Kathy McLean, have you got anything for us? Certainly do. Um, as I know, a lot of you already are aware that there are phenomenal recreational opportunities and icons in Eastern Montana. Um, so hoorah, Eastern Montana, what can I say? The other thing is, uh, Makoshika, of course, has always had very good visitation, very, and it's, it's been, um, uh, camping sites have always been a challenge and we have some now and we need more. Um, Ecolapa, the Medicine Rocks, having that um, des dark skies designation has kind of brought it to the world's attention, which is nice. I'm in Coal Strip, Coal Strip, amazing recreational opportunities, good hiking trails groomed throughout more city parks than I've ever seen per capita. I think it's amazing. But more deer and turkeys and pheasants, even in town, if you go on the hiking trails, you see more wild, wildlife here than you see people. It's awesome. Um, the public lands have had good access. I'm hearing no complaints that way at all. Uh, private lands, very excellent people to work with. Uh, my son's a hunter. One of the biggest uh, complaints he had because he's always elk hunted down in this area has been uh, permits. I think permits, that type of thing. And I've heard that because a lot of the permits go to out of staters has caused a little uh, change down here and it's been very difficult that way. The Castle Rock Lake, uh, people come here from Billings and the traffic from Billings has been pretty tremendous actually, uh, fishing in the summer and that some of the state trophy uh, fish have been caught here. And um, the, there are even winter ice fishing out there. I just went out and saw some ice fish. Here. So that's been nice. Um, I even have a zip line in my yard and just so you know, I, I mean, this is cool. <laughs> and although my zip line comes down right over my fire pit, which I think is a little off, but whatever. Hmm. Um, and Liz, talk about engagements. 
I um, just got engaged myself here. So it's been quite a, quite a nice area. Oh, congratulations. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the last report is from District 5, uh, our Vice Chair, Scott Brown. Have you got anything for us, Scott? Yeah, yes, I do. And uh, <clears throat> tell me this, are we transi transitioning to the main Fish, Wildlife and Parks meeting at nine? Well, I think, I think we're running a little behind. We got started a little bit late. Um, and so- Okay, good. Um, well, I'll make this uh, quick. Thank you. I, I attended the, uh, the CAC Region 5 meeting along with Brian Siebel, who's on the call. Brian is a uh, commission member, and uh, we had a very productive meeting. We got to tour uh, all of the improvements at Lake Elmo, and uh, boy, they did a bunch of uh, things on trails, on parking, on uh, picnic areas, and uh, Lake Elmo is looking great. Uh, so again, we got to uh, completely walk around uh, Lake Elmo. Uh, as far as the ACA group, it, it's those guys work so hard and it's such a uh, diverse group from all these small towns around Billings, uh, Ballantyne, Absorky, Columbus, uh, Laurel, lots of, uh, lots of, uh, of, of uh, coverage of our area. And they really do a good job of uh, meeting and discussing the ideas. And there's a lot of respect within the group. It's, uh, it's really something to see. Um, the Cooney Reservoir uh, numbers were down this year. It was interesting, the floods in Yellowstone and on Rock Creek, uh, they really impacted the Billings economy. For instance, the base camp, we were affected in Billings by all of that uh, flooding and we, uh, were impacted in both June and July, as were the uh, Montana State Parks. Cooney ended up down 30% from last year, whereas uh, Chief Plenty Coup was up 11% and pictographs were up 121%. And again, it just reflects people having time to get to go visit those parks that were not impacted by the uh, by the flooding, and uh, we talked also about the land acquisition in the Big Snowies, and evidently there's one more public hearing uh, that is uh, in the process, and once that's completed that land acquisition will be uh, completed. And I don't know if any of you have spent time in the big snowies, but it's a beautiful range. And uh, who was it, Rick Gratz, or maybe it was Rick, had suggested the big snowies have the best view of other uh, mountain ranges in Montana than any other place. And uh, the new land acquisition is just east of this drainage called Swimming Woman that comes out uh, just kind of west of uh, Levina, Montana. But it's going to be a great piece of uh, ground for Montanans to enjoy in the future. And one last thing, uh, Mike Ruggles, who is our Region 5 supervisor, mm -hmm. is just a great guy and doing a, a terrific job. He feeds me information all the time and uh, he, he's got both feet in, uh, planted in his job. 
good guy, Mike Ruggles. That's it, Russ. Okay, thank you, Scott. Um, <clears throat> it's great to get out to the parks and see them. Um, I enjoyed going camping at um, Lost Creek. I bumped into Hope Stockwell. She was there camping with her family. So that was a, a nice uh, little treat. Um, next thing on our agenda is uh, the director of Warsex Agency report. Um, Hank, are you ready? Yes, Mr. Chair, I, I really don't have a lot to add. I wanna, um, first of all, I just wanna apologize for the kind of the cluster getting this thing going this morning. Hopefully you can see us now and things are working a lot better. Um, I really don't have a lot to add. Um, I, I appreciate everybody giving their reports. I think they've done a great job on this and and thank you for the shout out to uh, Mr. Ruggles. I, I know Mike does a great job as do all of our regional supervisors. They, they're dedicated individuals. Um, I think we'll just uh, to kind of save time. We'll just go ahead and turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is uh, acquisition and transfer of interest in uh, land policy renewal. Um, Hope will uh, give this presentation. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Good to be with you today. As noted on the cover sheet, statute requires the board to review and approve of all acquisitions or transfers of land and water under the board's authority. This includes state parks, heritage sites, recreation areas, affiliated lands. Statute also directs the board to set policies and provide direction to the department for management, protection, conservation, and preservation of state park sites. In 2015, in this vein, the board adopted its first lands policy to provide more consistency in how sites are assessed for continued administration or for acquisition as new property, setting forth criteria and conditions that the board would consider. Uh, these related to, for instance, criteria related to significance, relevance, and accessibility of a site. The policy was renewed in December 2018 for another three year period and it's simply reviewed or due for renewal again. There are no significant changes proposed. The changes that you see in the draft you received reflect the reorganization of the department and better account for references to the agency as a whole instead of an individual division. And then it also uh, clarifies in all references that the policy uh, applies to all state parks, affiliated lands and recreation areas. The words were not consistently used in the previous version. And so this is just to bring consistency. And with that, Mr. Chair, I turn it over to you for any questions. Okay, um, affiliated lands, um, could you give us a couple examples there? Sure, Mr. Chairman, there are about a dozen affiliated lands. They come to the agency in different ways. Uh, but on the current list, we have about a dozen. They account for about 1,800 acres. A handful of them, for instance, are shooting range sites. There's another property in the Bozeman area that is actually managed by the city through an agreement, but we own the land. So it's those kinds of instances. They're sites that we're not actively managing as state parks. Okay, thank you. Um, does uh, any other board member have a question? Um, seeing none, um, I need a motion. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Okay, um, then I'll need a, the motion would be to uh, approve the uh, acquisition and transfer of interest in land policies, correct? Correct. Okay. And then and I'll I'll second it. And Scott uh, has second that. Um, Thank you for the motion. Now it's time for uh, public comment. If there's anyone in Helena who would like to comment, um, or do we go just right to um, our Zoom? Um, Mackenzie, you get us Mr. going Chair, here. We have any commenters in public? And then our, our Zoom coordinator, from Legislative Services is Hunter Kamick, and uh, she can let you know about the online attendees who might have their hand raised. Okay, Hunter, can you, have we got anybody that wants to comment on this? 
Hey, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, if there's anyone in attendance who would like to uh, speak some words on public comment, could you please raise your hand? Mr. Chair, it looks like we have one. Uh, oh, never mind. It looks like we have no public comment at this time. Okay. Uh, thank you, Hunter. Um, since there are no more questions for the board, uh, let's vote on this motion. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Do we have any nays? Okay, so that motion will um, move forward. Vote of five to zero. Um, last item on the agenda for the Parks Board, um, uh, public comment for issues not on this agenda. Um, if there's anyone in Helena, or uh, Hunter, do you have anyone um, on Zoom that would like to make a comment? Yes, Mr. Chair, um, we have Mike with their hand raised. Hey, Mike, uh, state your name and um, where you're from and uh, who you represent, please. Sorry, my name, my name is Mike Spatorno and I'm representing myself. Go ahead and make your comments, please. Okay, my comment is uh, is going to be on this uh, amendment to Area Three Thirteen, the uh, Yellow Northern Yellowstone Elk Herd. Yeah, that uh, that's not uh, part of the Parks and Rec Board. That would okay. be more directed to the Commission. Am I correct there? Okay. Yes, Mr. Um, Chair, that would be a commission. That would be a, on the commission, during the commission. Okay, Mike, uh, if you can come back around in the, the next portion of the meeting <clears throat> and um, come back in and comment there. Okay, I'll come back in on that portion of the meeting. Thank you. Yeah, this, this is the Parks and Rec Board meeting. Okay. okay. And I think that's everything that, um, do we uh, hope, do we need to adjourn the parks meeting or do we just uh, join in with the um, commission meeting now? Mr. Chairman, we'll have the board stay in session and, and join with the commission for the next section of the agenda. Okay. All right. So we will start the joint meeting with the FWP Commission and the Parks and Rec Board. And uh, Deb O'Neill will be giving us our legislative update. Good morning, uh, chairs, vice chairs, uh, commission and board members, and Director Warsak. My name is Deb O'Neill. I'm sorry I'm so dark. Um, my name is Deb O'Neill, and most of you know me as the Special Projects Manager for uh, FWP. I'm also the Legislative Liaison, one of them. Um, this is my third session doing that. This is going to be a repeat for some of you, um, but I hope that's okay, and it'll be new for the others. Um, I'll just go over some legislation that FWP has um, identified as priorities for the agency and has asked uh, legislators to sponsor. Um, we go through a process every year identifying things that we need to either change or repeal um, or add to statute. Um, and we bring that to the EQC, the, our interim legislative committee, and they approve what goes forward. So obviously you're gonna see a lot, a lot more bills coming from legislators regarding FWP, um, but this is just our what we call our bills, the ones that we will be proponents of that we've identified as priorities for the agency. Um, I am on a very, very small screen, so I will not be able to see if there's anybody um, needing to ask questions or have comments on the bills as I go through them. So I'm going to rely on either um, Chair Robinson or Mackenzie or somebody to or Hunter to help identify those because I'm going to be only looking at um, some a, a different screen on my tablet. So hopefully you'll be able to help me there. 
Um, I can answer questions as we go through. Most of these are cleanup bills and I could answer questions um, after any of the bills I go through, the 14, or I could wait till the end, but please uh, jump in and let me know if there's questions. So this first one is um, about e-tags. So as you know, we now have e-validation for uh, game animals or wild turkeys. Uh, you do not have to have a paper carcass tag for those animals if you choose. Um, what we are seeking to do is add uh, to the statue any species for which a carcass tag is issued. So any species that has a paper carcass tag, we're seeking to allow an e-validation and that could include wolf, crane, paddlefish, even down the road. Um, it's not seeking to definitively add those species, it's just seeking to allow to add those species in the future. And I'm going to be jumping between screens here, so pardon my pause. The next one also has to do with a paper license or tag. Um, right now we require that a paper license or tag, if you choose that option and not the e-validation option, um, if you choose a paper license or tag, we require that it be attached to the game animal or turkey. Um, we ha have understood that there's issues out there with paper tags being ripped or get wet. Um, just like with the e-tag, this only needs to be in your pocket and accompany the animal. And so we are seeking to ask uh, the legislature to approve that uh, a paper license or tag just accompany the animal and not be attached to, to the carcass. The next one, um, so last session we had removed a wait period between purchasing a mountain lion or bear license and actually harvesting the animal. There was a wait period between when you could purchase and harvest and that was 12 hours. The only species that has a weight requirement now is wolf. And there's a 24 hour weight requirement for between purchasing a license and harvesting in the animal. We're seeking to remove that weight requirement. This was brought by enforcement. Enforcement doesn't see this as an issue. Uh, the concern of course was people shooting an animal and then buying a license afterwards. Um, they don't think this is an issue, so we're just trying to be consistent and ask that wait period be removed. The next one has to do with air, aircraft and drones or unmanned aerial vehicles, AEVs. Um, we're seeking to include drones in the definition of aircraft which means that a drone would be um, uh, permitted to be used just like aircraft, meaning you couldn't fly and hunt an, an animal on the same day. So um, if AEVs or drones are included in that definition, we would treat them just like aircraft. The other um, odd part of the statute is that it has it's, uh, the current statute obligates the department, Fish, Wildlife and Parks, to permit aircraft aircraft activity on national forest land. We've never had that authority. We are not the landowners and we shouldn't be the ones to allow aircraft to, to tell um, uh, people when they can land or where they can land on land that's not ours. So we haven't had that authority. Although the statute gives us the authority, we, we haven't sought it. Um, and this will remove the obligation for the department to um, permit that activity. This next one is a very popular program. It's the Wildlife Habitat Improvement Program, or WIP. Um, our, the department and landowners cooperate on this program. We spend about $2 million a year on it, and it improves habitat on, on private land um, and uh, removes weeds, um, things like that. And it's very, very popular with landowners. Uh, it is due to sunset or terminate this year or this next year and we are seeking to repeal the termination date and let this program go on in perpetuity. Uh, 
Um, this one has to do with landowner preference, um, hunting licenses and permits for deer and antelope. Right now in statute, we have elk landowner preference points in statute. Um, we do not have deer and antelope in statute. So we are seeking to add that um, in so uh, we can continue operating as usual and just be consistent with elk. This one has to do with college, non-resident college students. So currently non-resident college students must come into an office to purchase their uh, hunting license. Um, and, and that was because we wanted to see proof that they were a non-resident college student here in Montana. Um, but we have the capability of um, having them upload those documents, just like we do with veterans. They upload their papers to prove that they're a veteran. We can have college students do non-resident college students do the same thing um, to prove they're um, a student here in Montana. Uh, they do not need to come into the office. And so we are seeking to allow them to purchase licenses online, just like any anybody else. This one is a pretty easy cleanup, we think. And, and, you know, like I said, most of our bills are those cleanup bills, things that we identify as not working or out of date. And this is one of those out of date ones. Um, currently, our uh, or in the past, our license agents who collects who collect um, uh, revenue on our behalf when they sell licenses, we required them to carry a surety bond. Uh, we do not require that anymore. Uh, we just sweep their bank accounts for the money that they collect on our behalf. And this is an out of date um, statute and we're seeking to repeal the surety bond requirements. This is another cleanup one. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, this last session we missed this. This is an act removing reference to a repealed non-resident snowmobile permit. So the snowmobile permit has been repealed, but there's still um, reference in a statute to that permit. So we're just seeking to repeal or to remove that reference in, in the statute. You know, very exciting bills that we're bringing forward at times but they're, they're necessary. This one, um, I wanna start out by saying does not apply to wardens. In fact, they're, they're exempted in this statute. So this has nothing to do with wardens, but this is an act allowing qualified Fish, Wildlife and Parks Department employees to carry firearms, to carry out their assigned duties. Uh, we do know um, at currently uh, we have staff that need to carry firearms um, for their day-to-day -day work, uh, for instance, putting down an injured animal. And we are just seeking to get this into statute. And this will allow um, our director to create arm rules um, surrounding this. And our director has committed to making sure that employees other than wardens, that they have a different, um, uh, uh, they have different rules applying to them, but that these employees will qualify annually uh, to be able to use these firearms and all firearms will be department issue. They will not be personal firearms. Just four more here. Again, this is a real good feel. Uh, this is a feel good uh, statute. Um, right now, people who obtain a lifetime fishing, fishing license for the blind they're exempt from having to buy any prerequisite license like base hunting licenses, except for the uh, AIS prevention pass. They must still purchase that according to statute. So we're looking to exclude that requirement. So all they have to do is obtain a lifetime fishing pass, fishing license for themselves without any pre prerequisite licenses. Last session, we um, were able to get an increase in the block management program from $15,000 to $25,000 cap uh, payment to landowners. This session, we're seeking to increase that again from $25,000 to $50,000. Uh, 
our director has the authority to increase the per hunter per day um, payment, which right now is $13, and he has the authority to increase that, but not the authority to increase the, the cap, and that lies with the legislature. Um, if he increased the hunter per day uh, payment um, without increasing that cap, we'd have more landowners bumping up against that cap. So we want to make sure that both of these happen in tandem. Um, and it, it's a very popular program, of course. We, we know how many people use the block management program. And we also want to increase the cap um, not only to um, get more landowners under that cap, because we do have quite a few that exceed it. Um, we also want to stay competitive with other options out there. Um, we know that, that landowners um, want to do the right thing. They want to allow access to the public to public hunters. And by increasing this cap, we, we feel that we're allowing them to stay in this program and, and recoup any losses that they might have um, from damage from, from hunters. Last two. Um, this one is um, will uh, go into effect basically once grizzly bears are delisted. I mean, the, it'll be in effect already, but this has to do with after delisting of grizzly bears. Um, this ensures that FWP um, will have a strong commitment to manage grizzly bear populations at levels to maintain those delisted the delisted status. Um, commissioners, you remember you approved this, um, and this is an arm rule. Um, you approved this earlier this year, and we're seeking to get this into legislation as well to just highlight our commitment um, to maintaining grizzly bears at, at delisted levels or delisted status. Um, what we did was we borrowed language from, um, I believe it was Senate Bill 200, um, having to do with wolves when they were delisted. The Fish and Wildlife Service was comfortable with that language. And um, so we included that language in this, this bill as well as arm roll um, because we think that they understand that language, they're comfortable with that language and they understand that we are committed. This also includes mortalities um, of grizzly bears out of the population, not, in, not just actual mortalities, but translocations of grizzly bears will be included as mortalities out of um, the delisted populations. And the last one has to do with the Upland and Game Bird Enhancement Program. This is not the pheasant program at the prison. This is um, Upland Game Bird Enhancement Program that's been going on for decades with FWP. Uh, right now, we are required, the money that funds this program, we are required to set aside 25% annually to release upland game birds and 15% of that must be spent annually to release upland game birds. We have been in violation of the statute for years now. Um, landowners aren't that interested anymore in releasing upland game birds on their property. They really focus on improvement of habitat. So we um, are seeking to, the Upland Game Bird Council who oversees this program they recommended to um, change the must use the 15% per year uh, to a shall. And after we heard loud and clear from the public that um, habitat improvement is very important to them, we decided to repeal that portion of the statute um, and remove the requirement of, of um, using that 15% per year, 15% of the funds per year to release up on game birds. That doesn't mean that landowners who want to, um, who are in this program, who want to release game birds, um, they can't, they certainly can, but we are just removing that reference in the statute. And that is all I have, and I'm happy to take questions if anybody has any. Um, I have one on uh, number two. The uh, paper tag, I guess I'm old school. I still use paper tags. And you said that it does not need to be attached to the animal. It just needs to be carried. Um, in that, should the language say your validated tag needs to be on your person? Um, 
Yeah, I, I didn't go over the language of the, the bill, but that, that is certainly a good point, Chair Kip, um, that it should be a validated tag be accompanying the carcass. Yes. I think Commissioner Siebel has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. O'Neill, just can you clarify on the non-resident college students what the current policy is, what, what they're actually buying, what, what how we treat non-resident college students in time? Sure, sure. Uh, Chair Robinson, um, Commissioner Kip, they get a reduced um, tag for uh, per purchase. And this came about last session. So anywhere the, there's, um, I'm sorry, just another thing popped up. Anywhere, um, if they come from a state that has reciprocity and a tag of equal, um, I'll say value or the same species, they could buy a license here for a reduced amount. Um, now that doesn't mean they could buy an elk tag if they are from a state that doesn't have elk. They can't do that. So this is a reciprocity. They re purchase a tag for a reduced amount for um, the same type of species that they have in their state. Are there any further questions? I guess I have a question now. Do we open this up to uh, public questions? No. no, this is just informational only. It's okay. Yep. Um, I, that would conclude um, today's meeting for the um, Parks Board. Um, and we haven't set a date for our next meeting. We'll determine that later. And um, so hope everyone has a great holiday. If you travel, be safe. Um, when someone would like to make a motion to adjourn Mr. our Chair? portion of the meeting. Yep. Mr. Chair. Yes. You still have the budget presentation from Lena to go over. I'm sorry. So after she's done, then you can adjourn, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Kip, Chair Robinson, members of the board, uh, members of the commission. My name is Lena Havron. I'm the chief financial officer here at FWP. Just gonna go over um, briefly our budget request coming into this session. Uh, if you go online and you go to mt.gov, you'll see the governor there and he actually has a link to his budget books. We're in section C and section F. Section C is the house bill two. Uh, we're not asking for a lot. We, I think we have 0.75 FTE for the AmeriCorps program in parks and outdoor recreation. We have statewide present law adjustments. We're requesting uh, funding to continue for 701 revenues that we received last biennium. Uh, the revenue was ongoing. The appropriations were not. So that just, it's, it's not a new request in that sense. Uh, some equipment authority increases uh, for the programs to be able to keep their schedules. Uh, our big winner is the maintenance restructure. So you'll see some interesting requests and conversations regarding how we fund maintenance. Um, it's a very complex process. So you'll see reductions in our House Bill 2, both um, FTE and it looks like budget, so we have to remove it. And then we have to request for the programs to have operating costs to pay a maintenance rate. And then on the other side that you don't see is the authority to spend that in a maintenance proprietary fund. Uh, we have built a one pager. If anybody is interested in that, we can get that sent out. Um, but those are our large asks. Uh, we have a substantial investment in our long range building program, House Bill 5 for major maintenance infrastructure, um, some campground requests, some different uh, stuff like that. So we'll watch that move through the process for section F. But again, you can find all this information out in the governor's budget online. And that's all I have. Any questions? Do we have any questions? Sorry to cut you off there, Lena. Um, That's okay. Thank you for your time this morning. I'm just not reading my my sheet here. <laughs> so I guess that um, 
would conclude our portion of the board meeting. Uh, would someone like to make a motion to adjourn? One of the board members. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, I make a motion that the parks and outdoor recreation um, close our meeting. Okay, I'll need a second. Is that Scott? Raise your hand. You're, you're muted. Okay, Scott seconds that. Um, so the meeting is adjourned. Um, th thanks uh, to the commission for letting us uh, be be part of our meeting, and I'd like to stay online and see where you're headed. Thank you. We um, appreciate the opportunity to have a joint meeting with you, and uh, you're everyone is more than welcome to stay on. I guess before we start, does the FWP commission need a short break or do you want to wait till we get a little farther into the agenda? Keep going. Okay. Madam, Madam Chair. Yes. Can I recommend that the, the parks board just uh, remove their video? Maybe that'll help us too. If they're not going to be part of it, they can listen in, but by all means, they just, and it looks like they've already done that. So I think we're okay. Couple of them. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right, so I will um, call the Fish and Wildlife Commission meeting to order. First of all, um, and for, first and foremost, we need to thank the staff for uh, this turnaround in a very short amount of time. I know it wasn't easy. We appreciate everything that you've done to get us up and running today. And uh, I think we'll have a good meeting and I just, want to make sure that you all know that we very much appreciate everything that you've put into this. I will start out with the approval of the October commission meeting minutes. If uh, I would entertain a motion from someone. I will so move. Okay, Commissioner Lane. I will second. Okay, Vice Chair Tabor. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? Okay, if not, all those in favor of the approval of the minutes signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay, we have uh, commission expenses. I would entertain a motion to uh, approve the commission expenses. So, Madam move. Chair, I move. Okay, Commissioner Siebel. Second. There's someone like to second it. I'll second. second. Okay. Is there any discussion on the expenses? I, I would like to make a comment that I really appreciate the level of effort that's been put forth by the department. I know there was a, a lot of catch up done and a tremendous amount of work um, has been put into it. And, and now everything I think is sequenced and caught up. So thanks to the department. Um, and and director, would you please help me out? I can't remember the name of the individual you assigned, but but that that individual did phenomenal work in in digging into all the history. So I'd I'd like you to recognize who that is. That would be Kenzie, ma'am, or sir, and uh, and Kim Weddy. We've got two of them that worked on this to get it caught up. I really appreciate their efforts on this, and uh, I appreciate that the commission recognized that as well. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hello, all those in favor of approving the commission expenses signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign, motion carries. All right, we'll move on to the commissioner reports. So uh, Vice Chair Tabor, would you like to start? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Region one's been pretty active. They had an excellent uh, uh, citizens advisory committee meeting um, and it was focused on hearing from legislature, legislators and there was a, a, a very good interaction with regards to questions uh, regarding access, elk, um, increases on both residents, non-residents on the landscape to name just a few of the topics. In the fisheries department, they're still working very hard on um, working with federal partners 
um, to work on the Libby Dam and the Didmo project. It's a very, very important project. They did complete the uh, bull trout red count for 22 and um, region wide, it looks good with the exception of the swan drainage. Um, it is down fairly materially from the long-term average. Um, they feel that it's probably most likely attributable to the lake trout and the introduction of that uh, um, where they migrated from the Big Fork Dam. So that's of great concern. Um, also the elimination of the kokanee that were in the Swan Lake are, are for all intents and purposes gone. Um, in the wildlife area, they had uh, a, a record year for black bears, 834 bears. 59% um, of these were harvested in the spring and 37% of, of those are were females. So they're staying right in the guidelines of what was uh, the goals. Um, you may also recall, because we had quite a active conversation about this, to use region one as the um, test ground area for having hunters collect teeth and then send them in. We have some pretty outstanding um, statistics that came through. Um, so compliance for submitting teeth was, was right at about 90%, which is pretty remarkable. And of the teeth that were submitted, approximately 95% were viable for aging, which is really exceptional. So I think as an experiment that indicates that we can perhaps uh, utilize that statewide. And so I would, um, you know, as, as a, uh, a future agenda item, I would ask that the department consider rolling that program to a statewide program after a successful experiment in region one. The lion season up in region one has gone off to a, a, a fairly smooth start, um, phenomenal conditions, probably the best lion conditions I think anybody's seen in quite some time, early snow. Um, there has been not only in region one, but uh, statewide, a little bit of confusion about the general mountain lions, lion license and the unlimited uh, license. I've talked to the director's office about that and I believe we're gonna work uh, collectively to get better clarification, if at a minimum within the regs in the future, or perhaps uh, changing some policy if it's necessary. Um, so far, there's been some very good harvesting going on. Um, there hasn't been the wholesale wiping out. Uh, in fact, probably uh, there's several districts that are still open um, and the pacing has been very good with regards to um, taking lions out of the various diff different districts. I would say about half maybe of the districts are still open and available for harvest. So far, there's only been two folks that have used the limited special licenses. My guess is they're probably waiting till the active uh, hunters come off the landscape so that they'll have the rest of the season to, to go after their, their prize. And wolf trapping has opened up now. Um, in fact, just as of yesterday, I believe it's opened everywhere now in region one with the exception of hunting district 130, which is the swan. Uh, everywhere else it is now open. Uh, the bears are safely down. Um, and so uh, I know there's a lot of folks that were anxious about that. And then finally, in the area of, of enforcement, um, a, a real, shout out to the wardens and the sergeants. Um, I think you might recall from my last report for region one that um, um, we were down um, five wardens in this region and those everybody else picked up the slack. And so they covered those five open districts. Um, fortunately, we have picked up two new wardens. They're uh, gonna start the academy here and be available to start working um, in the spring. Um, and they are currently working on, the, the existing staff is working on some fairly substantial cases um, that are evolving and they involve other regions and involve poaching um, uh, in other parts of the state by folks that, that are resident here in region one. So they continue to be very busy, but a, a true shout out to, to that enforcement staff. You know, they had a, a tremendous, uh, effort to have to cover such a big region with down so many people, but they, they got it done and they did it with great attitudes and we really appreciate all the efforts they've done. And with that, Madam Chair, I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Waller. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, not a whole lot to report in Region 2. Um, the, uh, of course, switching up gears from hunting to ice fishing, uh, very popular in our region. Um, fisheries reported better early on with the fresh ice, but uh, slowed down a bit in terms of uh, the reports from most fishermen and women. Um, definitely wanting to make sure everybody be careful out there with the incredibly low temperatures that we're seeing this week. But uh, like Commissioner Tabor said, lion hunting definitely uh, kicked off great this year. Uh, steady, but great with all the snow and the fresh skiffs every morning. <laughs> uh, almost the entire Blackfoot closed, roughly the entire Blackfoot. Um, in 285, I believe, were one short. 240, I noticed in an email, closed yesterday. Uh, the upper Clark Fork getting close, but the lower Clark Fork and the Bitterroot are still open. Um, I believe 270 closed for mail, but um, everyone can get updates online with that. But yeah, really good start to the lion season. Um, game damage calls are way up. Um, private landowners looking for some help. Um, the office mentioned that they are looking into um, some stored hay options for the ranchers, but uh, the uh, and they anticipate some current small game damage hunts, small sized hunts with the snow coming. Um, and especially with the lower temperatures and the snowfall. Um, it's kind of nice, it keeps animals sometimes redistributed. Um, and there's actually some deer hunts, game damage deer hunts going on near their Phillipsburg area, but d d d mostly elk, of course. Um, Jody gave us great parks and rec, rec updates, so I won't duplicate on that. Um, and last but not least, um, when I was appointed as a commissioner by the governor back in 2021, I was short-termed and my term is coming up in January and I've uh, decided to respectfully decline a renewal of my term. So I just wanted to tell everybody, uh, it, it, I am moving and that is why, but um, tell everybody thank you so much. It's been truly an honor to serve on this commission. Um, I love all the commissioners the director's office, the regional offices, everyone I've worked with, and including even um, the thousands I've heard of from the public. Um, game management is definitely, uh, you know, a complicated uh, science, but uh, one thing is for sure, and that's people are very passionate about Montana and about our wildlife. So thank you to everybody for the support and the friendship and best of luck to the newest commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Byer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, uh, you've heard a lot about lines and I won't repeat a bunch of stuff. Uh, in region three, the hunting season came up pretty well. Uh, by and large across the region, participation was a little below average, but harvest was a little above average. So it was a great season with good weather though. The weather did complicate it and made tracking easier, but at the same time, uh, made some access more difficult. So that seemed to balance out. Um, as always, uh, and as uh, Vice Chair Tabor mentioned, we're grateful to the wardens out there in the field and all the field biologists running their check stations and technicians and all the volunteers to uh, make sure we get really good information from the hunting season. Uh, we've entered the post season, uh, post general season, uh, hunting season, I guess. and. Uh, as far as game damage and supplemental uh, hunts, we've approved 10 uh, to date in region three. We have them uh, as far as the Shields and Ruby down to Dillon, up in the Helena Valley, uh, Boulder Valley. So uh, I just wanna point that out because it's important to, to show how, how responsive the staff has been to game damage issues. And uh, also to the landowners who are very collaborative and cooperative when it comes to establishing these hunts. Uh, many or almost all of these uh, ranches that entered these special uh, damage hunts uh, have been, have a long history of allowing public access during the during the general season. I think uh, one hunt uh, bears uh, mentioning especially, I think the staff and the landowners down on the Matador Ranch and the Blacktail and uh, Centennial did an amazing job of coming up with a creative approach to uh, uh, getting a good harvest of elk that are that were camped out in pivot fields. I think uh, I heard from Logan, the chair of the CAC, that it was close to, um, I think it was about, well, I wrote it down somewhere, but I think 
I think they got uh, almost uh, uh, 200 elk harvested. It's a very intensive effort on the part of rancher, uh, the ranchers uh, staff as well as department staff. And about 10% of those were bulls that were taken by youth hunters. So that was a really uh, impressive creative solution on the part of the regional uh, staff, the hunter, hunting coordinator and our biologist down there. Uh, and I wanna applaud that effort, especially. I mentioned that, well, I guess uh, actually it was over almost 400 elk harvested, not uh, 100 or 200. Uh, there's also some interesting efforts over in the Paradise Valley, the landowners of the Antelope Butte Ranch and Mountain Sky Ranch got a lot of public hunters out there and they had a really strong harvest as well. So I'm grateful to the, these landowners and I'm grateful to the staff that, that put so much time in. I uh, attended both the uh, regional CAC meeting and you've heard about the legislative update that was given there. And I wanted to thank Deb and uh, Mike for coming down and also all the legislators from the region that came to join us at the CAC and interact with our members. Uh, uh, the same goes with the uh, Upper Missouri River and Reservoir Citizens Advisory Committee. We had a meeting last week. Uh, both CACs have been very active, uh, very conservation minded and problem uh, solvers and came up with a lot of creative solutions. So I just want to express my gratitude to all those members for the time they put in to um, to help the department uh, work through these issues. As, as Commissioner Waller said, uh, people are passionate and it helps to have uh, problem solvers engaged. And then uh, like Commissioner Waller, my term ends here at the end of the year. And I just wanna say how honored I've been to serve the people of Montana, uh, serve the wildlife of Montana. Uh, I gotta say when I was uh, first entering the profession 35 years ago, I sat down with a couple uh, researchers for a beer. I was just getting started in graduate school and I couldn't believe how cynical they were. They were basically spent a two and a half hours trying to talk me out of going into the profession. And uh, it struck me as odd, uh, but now I understand better. It's because it's difficult. Uh, wildlife management in Montana is difficult because of the passions that arrive. And, uh, but over my uh, career, what's been impressive or impressed upon me is that it, it really requires a three-legged stool. It, it first requires a dedicated staff, highly trained biologists, uh, field techs, wardens, and uh, regional staff that really uh, on a day-to-day -day basis interact with the public in their, you know, in the far corners of Montana and at the regional offices. Uh, they're the glue that holds us together. They're, they're the ones that provide the data and uh, the hard work it takes to gather that in all kinds of crazy weather. Uh, that informs our decisions. And the second thing is the public. And the public, whether they're ranchers, hunters, anglers, uh, landowners, outfitters, or guides, uh, having access to the wildlife resource and sharing in that, uh, sharing their passions and sharing their ideas and when they're happy and when they're not happy, it's really important. And finally, uh, the other leg of the stool is just having good habitat, whether it's cold, clean water, uh, abundant water or enough water, uh, and across the landscape. We can't uh, manage wildlife strictly on public land. So uh, private landowners across the board, uh, not always happy with what the way things are going, but they're passionate and they work with us. And I think at, the, at our best, the commission works when, with all three all three entities, and we th we're conscious of that. We have to base our decisions on good science. Uh, if we wanna perpetuate our wildlife, we have to listen and engage the public as much as possible, even as difficult as it can be. And um, finally, we, we do uh, have and will continue to respect both private and public land as our uh, providers of habitat. And so in the big picture, it can be very painful, as you've all observed on the commission and uh, through life, but it's that it's that chaos and that uh, passion that is the miracle of Montana's wildlife. If you look at it, when I was a kid, 
uh, started hunting probably around 1970 with my dad and, and brothers. And uh, things were pretty tough. You weren't supposed to eat uh, more than a couple grouse because of endron poisoning. Uh, limits for ducks were basically you could shoot either four drakes or a hen and a drake. Uh, elk were pretty limited. They weren't they weren't abundant in uh, where I grew up in central Montana. They were uh, abundant in certain places, but not not statewide. This is a miracle of uh, wildlife management, and it comes because all three uh, things are brought to bear. The public's engaged. Our staff is highly trained and successful, and we talk about habitat and we work with landowners, whether it's public or private. Um, so it's been a great honor for me. It's been a great frustration for 35 years and the commission was a great challenge as well. But I feel like uh, just having been part of this, what I consider a, a, an amazing success story in Montana wildlife, where we argue more now about abundance than we do scarcity. And that's uh, each of you as commissioners, as staffers, field biologists and wardens, technicians are all to be applauded for your, your part in this. Uh, so thank you uh, both uh, commissioners, all, all the commissioners, the uh, departmental staff either at Helena or out in the regions. Uh, you really are uh, my heroes and I just want to uh, express my gratitude and, and let you know that the, the folks in every little corner, whether you're in Ekalaka or uh, Libby, you're holding this together in spite of all the chaos. And I hope you'll continue to do that. Uh, with that, uh, Merry Christmas, everybody. And thanks again for the opportunity to work with you. Thank you, Commissioner Byarth. I just want to say that uh, Commissioner Waller and Commissioner Byarth, I've, it's been an honor and a pleasure to work with both of you. and. I always tell everyone that we have an awesome uh, commission. We're very diverse. We have respect for each other. And I think that we work very well together. So I, I thank you for all of your work that you've put into the commission because I, I know how much work it is. So uh, Commissioner Siebel, would you like to go please? Madam Chair, did you skip over Commissioner? I Wallace? skipped. I did, but I'll go back. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. First, <laughs> sorry, Casey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. First, I, I'd, I'd like to echo what you just said, and, and I want to thank Commissioner Waller and Commissioner Byers for their for their dedication and their service on the commission. So it's been a pleasure serving with you both. Um, moving on to Region Five. Uh, so far this year, we haven't had. Uh, I haven't had to approve any game damage hunts. I think Region Five is a little bit behind on, on the weather. We have snow. It's, cold, but not nearly as snowing cold as some places right now. So I'm sure they're coming, but importantly in the wildlife division, uh, we had a really, you know, a pretty good hunting season overall. Our hunters, we had uh, 4,439 checked and in every species, white-tailed mule deer antelope was all below average on harvest. Elk was at average, well, which is which is good. Probably most important for region five is our, our chronic wasting disease surveillance. At about 900 tests so far, there's still, there's still some trickling in from the muzzleloader season as well. Of those 900 tests, and it, there was 13 positives, and that would be uh, eight mule deer and five whitetails. So 13 is not great, but the good news, if there is any in that, is that they were from areas where CWD was already detected in Region 5. So at this point out of the 900 tests, we haven't detected that CWD has, has uh, moved to any new hunting districts in Region 5. Uh, there was an outbreak in Wyoming uh, that caught the big sheep die off, and, and it wasn't too far from our bighorn uh, sheep in the priors and the Bighorn Canyon. So we have a good population there, I guess, on the reservation. Uh, they, the department in Region 5 went and monitored those sheep and there was no indications that any of that, uh, the die off in Wyoming had spread into, into Montana. So that's good for the, for the sheep there. And then uh, one more thing in wildlife, and, and Scott Brown mentioned this earlier, is that the uh, Big Snowy uh, Wildlife Management Area, which was recommended by this commission, uh, was approved by the state land board, which is great news. And, and the big news is, is that the public opening, they're, they're doing work now with fencing uh, putting in pro, uh, uh, the parking areas. That's all going to be done this winter and this spring. And the public opening is planned for that area on May 15th, 2023. So it should be a really exciting time, really exciting and a great addition for Region 5. From the Fisheries Division, uh, lots of discussion about the flooding still. Uh, and it was brought up earlier, I believe uh, Scott Brown brought that up as well. The department usually advises on 310 permits, which are in-channel uh, you know, clearing of debris and, and, and some channel changes. 
Uh, normally there's about 60 a year that they advise on. So far there's been 300 that the departments have played an advisory role on, and that's in Carbon and Stillwater County. The, the good news from the fishing perspective is that Rock Creek, Yellowstone, and Stillwater, despite the historic flooding, uh, so far the, the, the all signs are that the fisheries fared fairly well, or very well actually was the words that I got from, from the regional office. So that's really good news considering the amount of water uh, that we had coming down those, those channels. Uh, probably the biggest news in the fisheries division, region five, and I'm, and I'm sure Mike Ruggles, our regional supervisor, is really happy. They did hire a new fisheries biologist for region five. This has been a long time coming, and this, this would be Demetra Blight, who started work on December 5th. So we're really excited to have, have Demi on board in, in region five. From an enforcement standpoint, uh, in, in region five, I guess the, the good news that I got was that in, in general, the, the interaction with the public was uh, public was was pretty positive regarding district changes and permit changes that we had from the last season setting cycle. And, and probably most importantly is that the E-tags uh, overall enforcement went really well in region five and, and had more public support than complaints regarding the E-tags, even, even in the infancy stage that we have right now with the tag. Uh, on the administrative side, mountain lions, we're still have we had the same issue with the general season and the unlimited tags. So there's some confusion there. We did have some elk districts that had shoulder seasons previously that were changed and now don't have shoulder seasons. So we're we're still getting that clarified and had lots of calls about that and trying to make sure people know where they can and can't hunt. And uh, also, and last but not least, uh, they had a, a, a really a, a good list this year of apprentice hunters, both resident and non-resident. And this year in particular, there was lots of non-resident use that that purchased the use combination, the youth combination license this year through the district office. So exciting times and, and uh, good things happening. And I'm sure we're going to have some game damage hunts coming up in region five, but uh, things are going really well. There. Thank right, you, thank Madam Chair. Commissioner Walsh. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Robinson. Um, it's snowing here in Martinsdale. And I just uh, first want to thank the staff and Chair Robinson for converting this into a Zoom meeting. Um, thank you very much to the region four staff for the detailed regional updates that I received uh, this week. And I'm just gonna highlight a few things from each of those reports. Uh, first, I'm happy to report that the hooked on fishing program is going well with more than 40 classrooms across the region participating. Um, ace fishing for the students in those programs are gonna start after the holidays. Uh, region four wardens stayed very busy during the rifle season. They regularly encountered hunters who were struggling to locate or validate their electronic tags. I think we all recognize this is the first year of using electronic tags, and we're hoping that this will improve in the future. Um, there was a lot of confusion concerning the general mountain lion tags and the unlimited special license. In the last 30 days, as an example, the region has refunded or replaced over 20 general mountain mountain lion licenses due to misunderstandings of what license was needed during the winter season. Enforcement in Region 4 has expressed concerns on how that would impact quotas and closures uh, moving forward. In fisheries, the crews have completed fall sampling and are working diligently to review and analyze the data now. Uh, Region 4's uh, sole permanent hunter check station, which is located in Augusta, reported one of the slowest hunting seasons in recent years. Uh, there were 2,222 hunters checked, representing a 37% reduction from the 10-year average and the lowest total number of hunters in about 30 years. This is the second lowest total big game harvest in Region 4 since at least 1983. Uh, CWD sampling occurred across Montana uh, this hunting season, and there are currently uh, nine reported positive cases uh, from Region 4. Five of those were in Hunting District 401, three in Hunting District 400, and one in Hunting District 405, which is the first detected in that district. Uh, Region 4 staff is just beginning postseason deer and bighorn sheep surveys. I'm going to take a minute and just recognize three employees in, in Region 4. First, Warden Trent Farmer was recently promoted to Game Warden Sergeant in Great Falls. Uh, Mark Schlepp, after 40 years with FWP, 
Mark has decided to retire. He leaves a legacy for wildlife and his exceptional work for FWP as Region 4 Wildlife Management Area Supervisor and Maintenance Supervisor. He leaves the wildlife habitat management areas in great shape for the future of wildlife and Montana's rec recreational use of these beautiful areas. Uh, John Taylor, our regional uh, recreational manager for Region 4 is retiring at the end of December after an exemplary 30 year uh, career with FWP. John's dedication has resulted in many parks in Region 3 and 4 being some of the state's best and John has been a mentor to many of FWP staff who are now successful due to his leadership. So congratulations to Trent, Mark, and John. And finally, a quick update from, uh, from me on the Madison River Work Group. For those who don't know, I've been honored to chair this work group. Uh, we, our last meeting was on November 30th. Uh, Deb O'Neill, Charlie Sperry, and Hope Stockwell uh, presented us, uh, and we had most of the Madison River Work Group members in attendance. They presented the findings of the public comment period, both the in-person meetings and the online feedback. And um, what I would say is that the feedback was uh, very diverse on both sides, uh, both supporting and against the proposals that were made by uh, Madison River Work Group. And uh, due to the diverse nature of the, the feedback and the complexity in general of this issue, there were some misunderstandings around it. Um, I think, uh, you know, the department has now informed uh, that both the, the department and the governor's office believe this issue will best be addressed by a legislative solution. And they're recommending that the EQC take this up as a study bill in this legislative session. Um, I think that's uh, the appropriate result. And uh, a few of our uh, work group members spoke up, notably Zach Brown, a former legislator and currently commissioner down in Gallatin County, uh, spoke up and supported this and, and hope helped uh, our group understand what exactly what this means. Um, I'll just echo the others here and, and thank uh, uh, commissioners Waller and Byorth for their service. And, uh, and Commissioner Byerth, I really appreciate the historical perspective that you shared this morning. That's uh, very meaningful and and uh, and lots to be optimistic about the future of uh, fish and wildlife in our state. Thanks. Thank you, um, Commissioner Lane. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I too would like to thank commissioners by Earth and Waller for their service to the commission and more importantly, the people of Montana. Um, but I, I mostly appreciate you, you know, your hard work and, and your friendship. So thank you. Uh, overall in region seven, we had a, a good big game hunting season, a game check station observations indicated that there was good success and overall a positive response. So even though we, we feel our numbers are down, there was a good, good outcome for the, from the hunters that checked in. Uh, we had a Region 7 open house meeting in Miles City last week discussing the mule deer management in our region. Our wildlife program manager, Brett Dorak, presented the current science and status of the region's mule deer populations. Um, after three years of drought, uh, Southeast Mont Montana deer have uh, populations are below long-term averages. As a result, management practices to secure the breeding doe populations have been implemented. Um, Post-season surveys are underway. As expected, some trend areas are showing lower than average deer numbers, while others are above the long-term trend. So there's a lot of variation throughout the, uh, the region. And with the early Early winter with cold temperatures and deep snow, will that will also most likely have a probably a negative impact on the populations as well as my attitude. Um, the biologists are closely monitoring the mule deer and will be adjusting the deer quotas as necessary that we can address as a commission. Moving over to fisheries. Uh, the Region 7 fisheries biologists have completed their open water field surveys 
and are compiling the data as part of the statewide fisheries management plan. Uh, the persistent drought throughout the large area is having a negative effect on the small pond systems in the region. Thus, more anglers will be drawn towards the bigger bodies of water for ice fishing. Um, going, moving into enforcement, Todd Anderson and the rest of the enforcement staff are nearing the end of this year's hunting season with the muzzleloader season ending last Sunday. Uh, officers are busy finalizing cases as well as working with wildlife biologists to address big game damage complaints. Um, and that will continue to be ongoing as, as I'm sure as this uh, season progresses. And then uh, just to keep it short as we, I'd like to thank uh, Brad Schmitz and all the region seven staff for their hard work this year and for all of their help and as well as wish them and, and all of you uh, a Merry Christmas. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll give a quick uh, Region 6 update. I wanna thank uh, Drew Henry for the update. I did a, attend the CAC meeting like most of you did in your area for the legislative update. It was a good good uh, group of people. Quite a few uh, showed up and there was good conversations. Uh, it was uh, just a, Good to talk to everyone about all kinds of different issues. And the Redwater Fishing Access Site development on the Missouri River continues to progress forward. Um, the archery and general hunting seasons for the access programs in Region 6 went well with no major issues. Still too early to find out the hunter day use. Um, expecting it to be lower in certain areas due to drought. And in Daniels and Sheridan counties, apparently they were way up with the abundant mule deer populations drying hunters to that area. And my personal note is all of ours must have went to Daniels and Sheridan counties. Not sure. <laughs> but um, landowner appreciation dinners are still being scheduled, hopefully in January or early February. If I remember correctly, I think it's been two years without having the the dinners for the program. So that'll be nice to get that back going again. I think it's a really great time for the landowners to visit with all the FWP staff. Uh, the Haver Urban Deer Hunt started December 15th. We approved it. The commission approved that. The hunt requires archery equipment only and hunters must receive permission from the city of Haver and hunt in designated areas for antlerless only mule deer does up to two per person in Montana residents only. Antelope are on the move, so it's just a uh, warning to travelers that be aware of their presence. Many have crossed Highway 2 already with hundreds gathering in the Milk River Valley west of Glasgow. Fish biologists are continuing to monitor survival in area fishing ponds. The outlook is bleak as many ponds that were able to survive last year's drought will likely see impacts this year. Hopefully some good winter and spring moisture combined with continued stocking efforts will continue to make these ponds available for fishing in 2023. Um, personally, yeah, the reservoirs in our area either dry or close to dry. So we need, definitely need some, some moisture. Um, the hunter numbers at the Haver check station were slightly lower than last year, but still 13% above average. Mule deer harvest remains 13% above average and expectedly um, decreased from the record high last year. We have uh, one new hire in Region 6. Uh, Cora Knowles was hired uh, to be focused on conservation leases and she's based in Malta. So welcome Cora to Region 6. And that ends my report. I will um, have the director do his report and then we're going to talk about the our commission 2023 meeting dates so direct madam madam chair before before we move oh. on i was i was the only one that did not get oh, sure yeah. <laughs> uh, I, i'd like to as well recognize uh, commissioners waller and and uh, byorth um commissioner waller you're you're an inspiration so my granddaughters you're their hero, so just so you know. <laughs> and and Pat, you've been a, a phenomenal commissioner. I love your passion. I know we don't always agree to, on things, but 
you are for the resource, you are for the people of Montana, and it's been a pleasure to work with you. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Tabor. Um, Director, would you like to uh, go ahead with your report? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. And um, yeah, I'd like to follow up with Commissioner Taylor Tabor is uh, I really do appreciate both Commissioner Waller and Commissioner Bioworth working on the, on the commission. It's been my honor, my pleasure to work with them um, as it is with all the commissions, but it, it uh, I've really looked at this in this role and seen seven commissioners for one for each region really be a benefit to the state. And as I've said before, as I listen to your reports and you, you, you go over what you've got that connection with each region, you cover what's going on. I've got a list of stuff I was gonna go over and every time I get this list, you guys cover almost everything on it. So it makes my job a lot easier and I really appreciate that. And you are really connected with the people and the resources. So I really appreciate that. I just have a few things that I, I would like to cover is um, that, you know, first of all, you've, you've heard the general big game season is wrapped up across the state and we saw mixed big numbers. And I think everybody's done a good job of explaining kind of what they saw in their area. Uh, wolf trapping season uh, across state with the, ex with the ex exception of uh, District 130 is, is open now. And what we've done is, I think you've seen that and we've had, what is it, Molly? We've had, <clears throat> We get reports in from the bears denning up and we have Molly working with this and we put this on our website to show where the bears have dense. So there's there's a good correlation with the science to show why we're opening and why we're not opening certain areas. So I think uh, with, with the theme of this, we keep with the science, we're throwing everything while we're, we're putting those things out there. So that's been very, very good. Uh, several have said there's been some confusion with the mountain lion licensing. Well aware of that, we will work to fix that. There was confusion with uh, you know what tag you had to buy and we will get that squared away for next year we have done quite a few refunds got that done um let's see what else here we have the draft grizzly bear plan uh yeah and, and eis out for public comment i did extend that for an additional 30 days due to the holiday and we want to make sure that we get the best information possible from state from individuals and uh and, and i expect we'll get a lot of input on that so um, statewide fisheries plan uh, will be released for, for public review and comments soon. This plan will really set the table for fisheries management in the coming years. And we look forward to getting a lot of comments on that. Um, one thing I would like to bring up too is, is I'm seeing a, 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 lot, a little bit of confusion with this process that we've set up with the commission process and, and the department's role and the commission role and everything else. And, I know there's some comment, comments on this 313, the last amendment that uh, Vice Chair Tabor has brought forward that it was a last last minute thing. The way we set this up is the department will, as a, on a topic will make their recommendations based on the science and then put that out there for public comment. For public comment. And any time anybody, including the department, if we see something wrong, we go through then a commissioner to make an amendment or a commissioner can make an amendment. That can come forward and have public comment done. That's where we're at on this process. So it, the process does give the ability for people to comment and to uh, Commissioner Bio's presentation, you know, the three-legged stool. You know, I, I see our role as providing the best science for the legislature and commission to make informed decisions with the input from the public. And that's how this process should work. So I uh, hope that clears some of this up for people. And that's all I have to say, ma'am. Uh, Director, do you want to touch on the, um the youth contest that the that they just oh yeah yeah i i, I did send that out the, the governor um i sent it to the chair and i apologize i'll send it to everybody else i got this late last night it was a uh a news release about the the governor put a contest out for an essay and i think there was 10 winners on that and it, it's really it, i thought it was really impressive i sent it out to all staff and i got quite a few people responding to it saying how neat it was to have uh you know the governor that cares and is passionate about what we do and uh, so I do appreciate that. I'll make sure that I send it out to all, all commissioners. And one other thing, I'm glad you brought that up, is the landowner appreciation dinners, and you're correct, ma'am, we are doing them again this year. And I've also asked that we invite the PLPW members and commissioners to those. 
because they want to come out to a, a dinner when we have with the landowner for their appreciation. And I've been to a few of them, and I think it's a really good, really good opportunity to meet with landowners who open their lands up for for hunting. So, Great. Any thank, other you. thank you, ma'am. All right. So, um, real quickly, everyone received the proposed 2023 commission meeting dates. I guess I need clarification. Do we need to actually take um, action on that, or do I just need to see if it uh, everybody is in agreement to it? We haven't done anything. No, we haven't done it in the past, ma'am. Okay. So just okay. just the dates to know and if this works out for you. Okay. So uh, real quick, February twenty second, April eighteenth, June eighth, August seventeenth, October nineteenth, and December fourteenth will be our meeting dates for two thousand and twenty three. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thank Dr. you. Rice, oops. Okay, somebody, oh, okay, Dr. Rice, would you like to go ahead? Morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Before I start with our one item this morning, I would also like to convey thanks to Commissioner Waller and Commissioner Byworth. It's been a pleasure working with both of you throughout your service on the Commission, and good luck in the future. And Fisheries has one quick item for you this morning is the approval of the commercial bait saining waters. This is done after a review of the availability of the fish um, typically in ponds that are used for commercial collection for bait. And we also take into account any new information on aquatic invasive species or uh, any new fish pathogens. You'll see in your packet, we've got 10 changes on that list, many of which related to the drought that a couple of you mentioned in the eastern part of the state. We did do a public comment period during which we did not receive any comment. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Does anyone, anyone have any questions? Chair Robinson. Yep, Commissioner Walsh. I move that the Fish and Wildlife Commission approve the approved commercial bait saning waters list for 2023 and 2024. I second. Okay, so Commissioner Siebel seconded. All right, any discussion before I ask for public comment? Okay, do we have anyone in the public who would like to um, comment on this motion? Madam Chair, I'm seeing no hands raised online for public comment. Okay. I just want to double check with the FWP and Helena for the regional offices. What exactly is going to be the protocol for today? So we know somebody needs to comment. Madam Chair, so my understanding is they will raise their hand if they have any if they have anybody there that wants to comment and then step okay. forward. We'll recognize them and they will comment. Okay, great. I just want to make sure I don't miss somebody. No, thank you, ma'am. So all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carries. Does anyone need a break before we go into this next agenda item? Yes. Okay. Yes. Let's take. Let's see what time it is. Oh, let's let's uh, resume again at like. Uh, is five minutes enough, guys? We'll uh, resume at ten thirty. Give you a little longer. So be back on ten at ten thirty, please.
to move on to the wildlife on my agenda it says that ken mcdonald is doing the presenting but it looks like brian we we're very little in the picture but who <laughs> who will be doing the <laughs> presenting yeah good morning madam chair members of the commission uh, you're correct it is brian wakeling uh, the game game management bureau chief i'll be presenting these items this morning um one thing i'd like to point out is uh we kind of get through this type of time of year it often uh can seem a little dull and dreary but i'd like to point out tomorrow's the solstice and from that point forward <laughs> the days get longer and we get more sunlight and uh it's pretty soon it's springtime so we got things to look forward to um so the first item that we have here today is uh some adjustments to our 2023 seasons license quotas ranges and some of the boundaries um this is a uh item we asked to be placed on the agenda um as we went through our season setting last year um, there were quite a number of changes and uh, a lot of moving pieces and parts. Uh, we did a lot of this um, right as we were also transitioning out of a uh, an older regulations database and trying to transition into a new one. Um, consequently, we wound up with a few um, boundary changes and a few quotas um, and quota ranges that we failed to catch. Um, and a number of these were pointed out to us by the public as we went through the season this year. <clears throat> in some cases with our quota ranges, um, we were unable to take advantage of some um, populations that either increased. Um, we uh, had a couple of populations where we would have uh, looked at some specific decreases. Um, however, uh, we were able to address those through some changes to the to uh, other quotas, so we were able to address those. Um, and in some instances with our uh, antelope, for instance, where we offer uh, second tags to people, uh, we actually had to deny that opportunity simply because we hadn't established the quotas or the quota ranges. Uh, consequently, uh, what we wanted to do was bring before the commission uh, at this meeting uh, some of those things that we um, we overlooked last year, and specifically uh, with the uh, the quotas and the quota ranges um, well, for antelope, there are three doe fawn, um, and these were all second licenses that could have been offered um, on uh, in region three, uh, three forty thirty, three fifty thirty, and three seventy thirty are the license permit types. Um, and what we intended to present was a quota of 250 with a range of 50 to 400. A, uh, for the 350, 30 would be a quota of 100 with a range from 25 to 100. And the 370, 30 with a range of 100, uh, or a quota of 100 with a range of 25 to 200. Um, we had two elk hunts that we failed to uh, identify ranges on. Um, these were the 3801 and 3802. These are both antlerless licenses within the elk horns. Um, because we had the quota that was, that was part of the approval, but we didn't have a range established and we want to establish that range of 50 to 400. And uh, for the 3802 it would be 50 to 400 as well. Um, finally, we had a mule deer antlerless uh, bee license that we, uh, we had a, a quota established for 50. Um, however, we did not have a quota range. Uh, that quota range would have been 50 to 150, and that's what we're looking to uh, to have the commission approve today. In addition uh, to that, we also noted several of our hunting district legal descriptions uh, that either um, largely they just did not uh, mirror what had been uh, printed within some of the maps, and so it was. Um, clearly confusing, didn't line up with what we had with uh, with the license permit types that were available. And so um, for Antelope Hunting District, the 360 Madison um, was, was printed correctly, incorrectly in the legal description. And so we wanted to correct that. Um, the Similarly, the 360 Madison within the Deer and Elk Hunting Districts was also uh, printed incorrectly. And so we wanted to correct that. Um, the 330 gravelly for moose was printed correctly, incorrectly, I'm sorry, and we need to have that one corrected. And then uh, the 332 blacktail for moose was also 
incorrect. And we also had a description for the 333 Centennial, um, which was we we had uh, eliminated, and so we need to uh, remove that uh, description. Um, we did have a number of uh, comments that were submitted um, in response to this proposal. And um, we did have an, an amendment uh, offered by Commissioner Tabor. Um, I would like to point out that uh, um, while it, it seemed to some folks that uh, this might have been a um, somewhat of a surprise, um, the, uh, the commission has the ability and the authority and the prerogative to make a, an amendment at any time, even up to and including today. And I'm sharing this primarily for the public's benefit. Um, but Commissioner Tabor had also indicated his intent to uh, look at this as far back as August. So um, when, uh, Commissioner, when the comments came in, um, Commissioner Tabor offered that amendment fairly early in the process and so it was available for review. Uh, the department, uh, our preference would have been to address this through the standard um, season setting process that would occur through next year. Um, however, I want to make it clear that this, you know, this is certainly within the commission's prerogative to address. Um, and essentially the proposal, uh, the amendment that as was offered um, was to take the 313.45 uh, license permit type within Region 3 in, in Hunting District 313, um, eliminate that and create, uh, a, rather than a three-week general season and a, and a permitted uh, two-week season, it would go to a five-week uh, general season. Uh, the department, um, our evaluation would indicate that we do not expect to have a population level effect uh, as a result of this uh, potential amendment. Um, we would expect that we probably see greater harvest on bulls and uh, we would probably see a reduction in the average age class of that, uh, of what we would see in there. Um, however, again, I'd emphasize that from a population standpoint, the breeding occurs, this is a migratory herd, the breeding occurs at an earlier time of the year um, and uh, the animals are in a different location at that point in time and the bull to cow ratio is likely higher than what we see on surveys. Um, a number of comments have come in since that time. Uh, some of those comments have suggested um, you know, alternate ideas that might be considered to include um, um, some antler point restrictions. Um, antler point restrictions, uh, as a general rule, uh, have an effect that uh, is not generally consistent with what um, most people expect. It doesn't increase the average uh, size of the antlers that are on the harvested animals puts more pressure on that age class. Um, however, if it's uh, an idea to try to um, simply restrict harvest, it certainly does work um, for that aspect of it. Uh, and one of the other uh, aspects of it that are often associated with that uh, include the potential for inadvertent harvest of an uh, unlawful animal. Um, be glad to take any questions. Uh, we certainly do have uh, our biologists from Region 3 uh, available uh, who can give a more detailed response to any of the questions that uh, the commission may have. Okay, I just want a clarification too, is the amendments that are put up for uh, to the public actually have to be, um, you have to make the uh, motion for the amendment too. So until the actual motion is made, then they're they're not uh, official. But I'll turn that over to Commissioner Tabor as to what you're what you would like. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I uh, appreciate that uh, opening. And I, I guess what I'd like to do is I'd like to first start off with a motion and and then kind of maybe set the stage for for a dialogue. So I move that the Fish and Wildlife Commission adopt the amendments to the licensing permit type quotas and quota ranges and hunting district legal descriptions as presented by the department in the cover sheet and accompanying amendment sheet with the following amendment, restore HD 313 to a general license five week general firearm season for brow time bull, BTB elk. I'll second that. Okay, second was Commissioner Siebel. So Madam Chair, let me just kind of set the tone here. Um, I want to have a conversation and, and, and basically the reason I want to have the conversation is to both help the 
inform and direct both the department as well as the commission on on the values component and process possibly the prescriptions that may come out of the elk management plan um, i know i have and i suspect that a lot of the commissioners have received a tremendous amount of input from the public um, over the last probably three months ever since the working group from the elk uh, working committee came out and there were a lot more ideas and a lot more things and have we considered this and have we considered that um, so there's still a tremendous amount of passion and interest in this um, i made this motion as it is stated but i am 100 percent open to modifying it doing a lot of different things so it's not set in stone what again what i want to do is have a dialogue and so the question is why am i doing this um, contrary to what has been often proffered in some of the comments, it really is not about the outfitting. Uh, the, yes, there were a couple of outfitters that reached out and asked for economic assistance. But honestly, there are more outfitters right now that have responded and, and dialed me up that are against this particular action than there are for it. So it's not an outfitting bill. And again, I tend to get very um, frustrated when people think that all I do is try to look after one constituency. And I, I, I firmly believe if you look at some of my other uh, actions, it's not, all, it's not always pro outfitting. So I'd, I'd like that to be clear. What I do care about though is public opportunity. And when I say public, I mean the entire public. So in this situation where we do have conditions on the ground, where we have a stable herd, and we heard from the department quite clearly in our August meeting that what we did on wolves somewhat, I, I don't want to say doesn't matter, but what we ultimately our choice between six or 10 or whatever wasn't going to have an impact because for the most part, we have a stabilized herd. Now, at that point, we didn't talk about age class and age class is an interesting topic. And it's something I really want to hear from a variety of different people because age class starts to move into a different category. And the real question, I guess, that I'd like folks that are gonna dial in and, and, and be part of this conversation is, what really matters more to you? Uh, you know, the opportunity to go to an area that historically does provide a tremendous amount of opportunity to fill a tag, or do you care about trophy status? I think, I think in many regards, if we are going to turn 313 in a trophy status scenario, then we should have, or it should have been indicated in the elk management plan that that is the case. Um, and, and I think traditionally this was never treated as a trophy district, but a lot of people and a lot of the comments that I've seen have come across saying, that's why we'd want to keep this going and, and consider other modalities because we want to continue to focus on bigger uh, elk, more points and that type of thing. There's some very compelling arguments relative to uh, what is happening with our current system. And one of the other reasons why I asked the department to look at this is I asked since we put this program into place, have we measurably, you know, have we really moved the needle much when it comes to the age class of bulls or, or the size of the bulls and all that? And the comment that I got back to the department and, and certainly Brian can confirm it today is, no, that, that particular technique really has not done much as it relates to age class. What's not clear is whether it has or has not done much to preserve the actual population. And that's where some of the comments that came through were really, really thought provocative. Um, so, you know, what I'd like to do is hear from the public, you know, attack the issue, don't attack the person. Um, I continue to get frustrated with, with innuendos and threats and things of what the uh, intent is. What I care about first and foremost is preservation of wildlife. I always have, always will. That hasn't changed. But I also care quite a bit about our hunting ethics in this state. And one of the things I really hope that the department does in the elk management plan is get a very clear sense as to where each of our citizens who, who want to inform us as to how passionate they are about elk hunting is where do they fall? Are you more about opportunity or are you more about trophy and quality? Both are ethics, both are values. Not everybody shares the same, but we need that information as we've gathered it in the past. We need it now in the future to make some good sound decisions. So please let us know how you feel about this. 
I want to shout out to some of the people that threw comments in because there was some really interesting information. Uh, I'll just name a few names, Sean Eckhart, Hayes Goosey, Mike Hemmenspach. Randy Newberg came through and asked, actually put in there, what, uh, what does the commission want? Do we want you know, to preserve quality? Well, that's not really a question for the commission. That's really a question for the citizens of Montana and the sportsmen. What do you prefer more? Because one of the things that I heard loud and clear throughout this last year and a half is access, more opportunity, more public land. And as I think we all know, 313 is probably one of the most unique public land environments there is. So yeah, we got to get balanced. We got to get smart about preserving the population, but do we also have to embrace opportunities to give folks more of a chance? So I'm looking forward to a lively debate. Don't know where this is all gonna go on a vote, but I appreciate the efforts put forth by some to be respectful and give information I will point out though that I still don't really appreciate when the NGOs start putting directly in their documents, you know, inaccurate information. That's not helpful to the dialogue. It's not helpful to the collaborative spirit. And I hope we can just focus on working together rather than pointing fingers and, and, and aspersions. So with that, Madam Chair, I'll turn it over to you to hear from the rest of the commission and the public. Okay. Is there any other comments or questions on the amendment as a whole. Oh, Commissioner. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I seconded Commissioner or Vice Chair Tabor's motion uh, for, for a lot of reasons. But the one of the first I want to say thanks to Brian Wakeling and also thanks to the director for pointing out the fact that, you know, despite many of the comments, and, and, and I do I also take objection to some of the comments, but I really appreciate the, the, the public input on this, and I think this is a great opportunity, as Commissioner Faber said, for a for a discussion. But I want to thank the director and, and Brian for pointing out that the, the the amendment put in by Vice Chair Tabor was exactly done, you know, per our current procedures for the commission. So there was no attempt to be, uh, you know, to slip this in in the final hour. No attempt. It is the December meeting, but this is when we do these things for mid mid season or mid cycle season changes. So. I think it's really important that we point that out and, and this was put in and, and it got rightfully so got a lot of public comment and that was the that was the intent of putting in the amendment in a timely manner like uh, Vice Chair Tabor did. And and yeah, I guess the things that, that, that really struck me regarding uh, you know the, this potential in 313 in particular is you know, the, you know, the question of uh, we heard I think it was back in August that, that we did hear that uh, that what had had transpired back in 2017 I believe when this was put into place and the fact that you know the, the whole point of this uh, you know was really was having that last two weeks season to protect bulls protect that 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 class uh, and, and protect the population really hasn't had the desired effect and i think that's really important because that's the science that's that's provided by the department we heard a lot of different comments from the from the public on that and, and i'd like the department to comment on that again but most importantly i think the discussion that that we need to have around this proposed amendment in particular is and it's a bigger discussion is really understanding this area and others as to what the public wants with regards to the elk management plan. And I would also ask, and these are questions that I'm gonna to ask to the department, I would like an update on the elk management plan. I know the region's working on them and to see what, what the time frame is gonna to be to, to and, and when the public is gonna have the ability to see these recommendations for the new plan. We're going on 18 years on an elk management plan, uh, the one that we're currently using. So it's due time to update it. This is an, a great time to start getting some public input on this. And I think a lot of the input and a lot of the, the discussion that we'll have today will have a big impact on uh, a lot of areas and what that elk management plan is gonna look like when we when we get that done in 2023. So with that, I guess I'd like to, I, I threw out a couple of questions there, but the, the main one is really the status of the elk management plan. And most importantly, the time frame and when the public is gonna be able to get be able to see, see that draft plan and get involved. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um... Mr. Wakeling, would you like to uh, cover that, please? Um, I would, uh, Madam Chair, members of the commission, uh, certainly um, uh, let me give just a real brief overview of, of, the, uh, of the, the population's performance, but I think I would defer to the region to, to respond uh, more, more uh, in detail. Um, if you look back historically, um, the population that we would routinely survey during the winter would be almost as high as um, approximately 20,000 animals. 
uh, that animal, the population size that we were seeing on surveys had reduced to about 3,000. Um, and currently we're, we're surveying um, a little over 6,000 animals. Um, that population uh, it has stayed uh, with a fairly stable bull to cow ratio. Um, and I think I'd like to ask Region 3 uh, to try to respond more, more precisely with some of the more recent and detailed information. Region three, are are you on there? I guess I see you're on there, but I don't know if we just can't hear you. We're coming. We're trying okay. to take the camera off. Okay, no, that's fine. All right, <laughs> Madam Chair. Yes. I think I think part of the question too was where the where the elk plan is. At. Yes. Yes. And I want to make yes. sure that Brian addresses that before we go into the region three. Okay. Yeah, I apologize, uh, Madam Chair. Um, and so where the elk plan is currently, um, we've, uh, we've had it out. Um, we've, we've held um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 public meetings uh, where we've taken input. Um, we're currently in the process of starting the initial drafting of that uh, product. Um, once, that, uh, once that product does have uh, an initial draft, um, we're looking at uh, somewhere in late winter, early spring to have a draft of it that will then be available uh, for initial viewing by the public where they can start to take comment. All right, thank you. Okay, go ahead, Region 3, if you're ready. <laughs> uh, sorry, dealing with some technical difficulties. Can you hear us now? Yes. Yep, go ahead. Um, so I think uh, Brian provided a pretty uh, succinct overview of that that population. Um, I'm not sure what additional uh, questions folks might have, but um, can certainly speak to um, population status or, or uh, bull ratios in 313 and the, the northern Yellowstone herd uh, both north uh, and south of the Yellowstone Park line, given that this population does uh, spend uh, a portion of its time in Yellowstone Park and that there are some animals that remain in Yellowstone Park all, all year long. Um, Do you have Ryan's... any follow-up? Oh, go, go ahead. I was just checking with Commissioner Siebel to see if what he asked uh, um, was covered. Uh, Madam Chair in, in, in Region 3, I'm sorry I didn't get your name. The, I guess the, the basis of my question was, was we, we saw a lot of public comment on what was put in place with the, with the last two weeks with the special draw, what the intent was. And I guess I'd like to hear from you what, what the observations were. We've had a long time to look at it. So with regards to the, 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 the current status of, of 313 and the special draw in the last two weeks, what impact that had, if any, because uh, we, we've heard a lot of things. We saw a lot of different things in public comment. And I guess in general, we'd, we'd love to hear more about the, the trends of, of that of that elk herd. And, um, and, and also, uh, you know, and again, I think going back uh, in, in, uh, to what Brian Wakeling just said about the elk management plan and, and, you know, the expectation is that this could be one of the areas in the elk management plan that could be managed for trophy quality instead of, uh, of maximizing opportunity and that's a fair thing. And I think that's what we're trying to discuss here and really, really get that information on the table because 313 and other areas in the elk management plan could be managed for trophy quality. And that's going to really dictate if that's the plan, if that's what the public agrees on and what the commission approved, that's going to, that's going to dictate, I think what we, uh, you know, what kind of season we have and, and how we limit those. So I'd love to learn more about uh, things like this last two weeks to see what impact it had. So that was kind of the basis of my question. So I'll leave it from there. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so the, the season structure that is somewhat unique in 313 that we currently have with this uh, last two weeks being permit only, that was a compromise uh, structure adopted by the commission uh, in, and went into effect in 2016. Um, initially, it had been proposed to go to permit only for the entire season, and uh, there was 
uh, substantial opposition to that from some groups, and it was also supported by uh, other groups. Um, the commission adopted uh, at that time this compromise structure, um, and part of the idea being that uh, more of the harvest uh, typically would occur later in the season as uh, migration out of Yellowstone Park uh, is more likely to occur later uh, in the season when uh, chances are greater to have a large uh, snow event that would push the population north of Yellowstone Park. Uh, we now have several years of data um, suggesting that We've not seen uh, a recovery in uh, brow time bull ratios uh, as a result of that season structure. Uh, as of last winter's survey, uh, classification survey done in, in late winter, uh, in the Montana portion of uh, the, the winter range, we're somewhere on the order of three and a half brow time bulls per hundred cows, and then total bulls, so when you include uh, younger bulls spikes essentially uh, on the order of, of 10 brow tine bulls or 10, 10 total bulls per 100 cows uh, wintering in the Montana portion. Any other? Um, Oops, go ahead. Uh, I guess one other note uh, I, I would say is that um, at the time when this compromise structure uh, was adopted, um, it wasn't necessarily uh, expected to have uh, uh, a substantial uh, re to result in a strong recovery uh, of those those bull ratios. Follow up, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to let uh, Commissioner Byers go first. Thanks, Madam Chair. I just wanted to follow up uh, with Mike on his. Um, you talked about bull cow ratios. What about cow calf ratios? And then also the first three weeks of the season were general opening. And how did the early weather affect harvest this year versus uh, uh, other average years? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so last winter we had slightly lower uh, um, calf to cow ratios than we had the, the previous couple of years uh, before that. So on the order of 16-ish uh, uh, calves per 100 cows, uh, generally that's kind of considered uh, a bit below what's necessary to, to maintain a, a stable population in this area. Um, prior to the couple prior years before last winter, um, we were right around just under 20, which is uh, about what we would expect to keep the population relatively stable. Um, and then uh, this year, uh, season started kind of slow, I would say. Um, we did have a, you know, a cold stretch of weather there right before the end of the general uh, season opportunity in 313. And we did see some increased harvest uh, during that time. Um, our total harvest estimates um, are not yet available. Those, those will have to wait until the completion of our harvest surveys, uh, which won't be done uh, until next year. Uh, Commissioner Siebel, did you have a follow-up? Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and, and Mike, just as a follow-up, can I know that the uh, previous commission, they spent a lot of time litigating, you know, a lot of discussion, many, many hours. Can you summarize it? I, I guess I'm confused. Was, was this, was the original intent of this change uh, to, to improve the, the quality of the bulls in the area, or was it to try to restore the, uh, try to restore the population, which was affected uh, likely by many factors, including, including the wolves in the park and in this area. So curious what the original intent was. Thank you. Uh, so when this was all, uh, uh brought up uh during the under the previous commission and and um as uh with my my predecessor as the livingston area biologist uh this was a intended to 
have an impact on bowl ratios. We wouldn't expect uh, this st structure type of change to have much impact, if any, on the total population. Um, this is is more of was more of a season structure discussion then as now related to bull ratios rather than the total population. Does that help? You're on mute. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Okay. All right. Um, do you have uh, people to comment in Region 3 since you're already up? Uh, yes, I think we do. Oh, okay. So if we, we'll just, just have that. Uh, yeah, just a second. We'll, we have a few folks that would like to comment here. Okay. Chair Robinson, how would you like the public to comment at this point? One by yeah. one? Yes, one by one, and it's a two minute time limit. I'll remind everyone that two minute time limit and, uh, just comment to the motion that's on the table. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I do want to remind everyone kind of to what Commissioner Tabor said, to keep it to the uh, motion that we have on the table and not personally. Um, and I will stop anyone who's, who uh, starts on the personal road. So I go ahead with your comments, please. Okay, hey, I'm Sylvia Arvizu. I'm from the Gardner, Montana area, and I work for the RTR Ranch, Royal Teton Ranch. Um, as you was asking about which way we lean, obviously, as a worker for the ranch, I lean toward opportunity. And I just have a just a couple of points. Um, I'm working on the ranch, and that is basically for us of uh, the elk herds coming in, are breaking our fences, getting into our um, feed um our, our feed pens hay pens uh, and they break in and get into that area and second of all other than the fencing and the hay pens uh they with the fencing being broken down and now with the uh buffalo situation that we're having um down there at this time they follow the buffalo will follow what's already broken down and then destroy whatever the elk have not destroyed so those are two really big concerns. And for us is the impact of the, of the fencing, the man hours to rebuild everything. Um, and also now we cannot lease our land uh, to other livestock because we have the elk. And just recently within the last few days, we had uh, over a hundred buffalo and over a hundred elk in our Northern fields. One was on one end, the other one was on the other end. And obviously they did get into the pens and most, uh, most of our fences now um, our fencing has been um, taken down, so we have to rebuild it. And that's the reason why the livestock was removed by the people who are leasing it. So that's a uh, real basic, uh, simple. Those are just a few points that I wanted to put in from somebody who's working on the ranch. All right, thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Edwin Johnson, and I live in what uh, has now become the Gardner Basin Buffer Zone for Yellowstone National Park in Area 313. Uh, for the past 16 years, um, YNP and their group interest groups have pretty much had their way. One day in 2016, we woke up to find the last two weeks of our elk season were taken away and replaced by a trophy hunt drawing. Um, working people in Gardner can no longer hunt the area with their kids after school or Thanksgiving weekends. Families are forced to travel out of Area 313 to unfamiliar areas. Elk numbers in 313 meet and exceed all of the elk management program goals and they are in our hay fields at the Royal Teton Ranch and in the entire Paradise Valley all year long. 
Now we can't even apply for a cow permit in area 313 and we're overrun with elk. Working people and Gardner have been hit hard economically by the flood and we have the highest elk mortality in the state along Highway 89. There's just, you know, it's a very dangerous area to drive for elk, and it's a very dangerous area for elk to be along. I've been dealing with the wildlife on the Royal Teton Ranch for the past 40 years. Now we have bison again. The weather is bringing them out in mass this year, and they're going to create a lot of problems. We're trying to keep them out of the Paradise Valley um, and the pressure on the livestock department and the people that Mike Hemmelsbach, I talked with a lot. Okay, um, your time, is, um, your, your two minutes is up for your comments. Okay, well, th thank you for mm -hmm. taking my comments and, uh, and for accepting uh, our governor's appointments to your positions. Thank you. Well, thank you. Do we have any other in Region 3? Chair Robinson, we are done with our public comments in Region 3. Thank okay. you. All right, thank you. Are there any other regions that have anyone in person who would like to comment on this? Okay. Hunter, do we have anyone um, on on phone or via Zoom who would like to comment? We do, Madam Chair. We have a few. Um, we can start with Nancy. Okay. Just a reminder, it's a two-minute and star six to unmute. There we go. All right. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Go ahead. All right. My name is Nancy Schultz. I'm a board member of Gallatin Wildlife Association. We're an all-volunteer organization, and we have been working for preservation of rest and restoration of wildlife habitats, migration corridors, and since 1976. I'm commenting to urge the commission not to extend the change in 313 and should include 314 from three. I, I don't think it would be in the best interest of wildlife to extend it to five weeks. Uh, it's an important elk migration route. It has been mapped uh, extensively, and the map migration go route goes right through uh, how Hunting District 313 and Beatty Gulch in 314. We know the migration routes are complex and embedded in the value of, my, uh, of, of wildlife. And we hope that these the importance of these corridors is thoroughly evaluated. FWP should evaluate factors, not just population numbers. In the past, FWP has closed 313. If weather was pushing elk north out of the park, weather this year has been anything but ordinary. Drought, floods, and now historic cold are impacting wildlife. FWP needs to keep hunting in these important migration routes, carefully regulated, and adjustments to hunting bulls is a primary consideration. In the past, FWP has closed hunting if weather pushes a large migration, especially to avoid a large take of bulls. FWP must have the authority to implement an emergency closure in this part of the district during a large migration. I went to the Gardner area yesterday to see the wildlife movement out of the park and talking to locals, I found out that wildlife movements out of the park is huge. They said that the largest wildlife that they have seen in the last three years. years. GWA urges you not to expand the hunting district for 313 and okay. 314. Thank so thank you. Madam Chair, next we have Mike Mershon. Okay, star six, go ahead. Hey there guys, you got me here? Yes, go ahead. Madam Chair, Commissioners, thank you for your time. Uh, again, thank you, Tabor, uh, for for narrowing in on on what you want us to discuss on this topic today. Um, I'd like the the commission to consider the consequences of uh, the the date mandated December muzzleloader hunt on this migratory herd, in addition to the additional two weeks of the general season. 
Um, the current structure of the hunting district 313 provides a unique balance. Um, of course, a three week general season provides plentiful opportunities and the limited 31345 per permit creates an additional trophy opportunity that's somewhat unique to the uh, area. You can look at the limited entry opportunities on the Gallatin side to see what kind of demand there is for a trophy unit around Yellowstone. 31346 has tremendous demand, uh, uh, approximately the highest in the state with a 0.68 draw odds um, to gain that permit. So that I, I feel like that shows that there's appetite to manage for trophy off opportunity in the area. Uh, I just ask that the commission votes against this amendment and uh, thanks for your time. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have the Montana Wildlife Federation. Okay, go ahead. Madam Chair and members of the commission, for the record, this is Marcus Strange with the Montana Wildlife Federation. I apologize for not updating my name on here. Um, thank you for this opportunity to comment. Uh, we are in favor of the season adjustments as well as the boundary adjustments. However, we do oppose the amendment brought by uh, Commissioner Tabor. Uh, you have our comment letter, so I won't belabor those points uh, in, in brief. We're opposed to this amendment because it goes against uh, sound biological principles. If you look at the uh, data from the department, um, you know, this unit is right around or below objective uh, for most of the last 10 years. Um, additionally, uh, there was a lot of compromise that went into the season structure and has already been highlighted. Um, this is a highly effective season structure that strikes a very good balance between opportunity, wildlife management, and also the opportunity to take a, a once in a lifetime uh, bull. And then finally, there are concerns about extending the season given that we have a heritage muzzle litter season and, and the impact that that could have um, in late winter snows. And finally, uh, I would just add that while we, we welcome the opportunity for conversations, we welcome the opportunity um, to engage in robust debate about how to best manage these wildlife populations. It's a poor opportunity to have that conversation when the amendment is brought a week before the meeting and we only have two minutes to give a sound bite um, over Zoom. You know, our phone lines are open. Please give us a call. If this truly was in the works since August, we would have loved to have had that conversation early and often. Um, this commission has been great to work with. We just need to know when things like this are coming so we can have that conversation. Um, and with that, I'll just say thank you and uh, turn over the rest of my time. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Madam Chair, next we have Dan Vermillion. Okay. Good morning, Madam Good. Chair. Um, members of the commission, this is Dan Vermillion. Um, I was the commissioner in 2015 and 16 when we passed this particular um, season adjustment. And, you know, as discussed, or I just heard a lot of the conversation today, it was done for some pretty distinct reasons. Um, one of the things that we've consistently seen, and I would assume you will consistently see if you get rid of these limited permits the last two weeks of the season is an increased likelihood for the possibility of an elk slaughter when those elk come out across Deckard Flats, when we put this permit compromise into place, elk did not get past Eagle Creek. They got, they'd come out across Deckard Flats and they would be wide open there in Eagle Creek and they would get pounded. And I spent a lot of time up there with the biologist and with the game wardens with my own eyes. And that's, it was very apparent what was happening. This proposal was made by the department originally back in 2015 by our local biologist, unlike as I understand it, this proposal. And it did generate a lot of conversation, but we did come up with a compromise where it would allow us to have, and it was you know, basically a concession to the outfitting industry to make sure that they weren't going to be subject to the 10% limitation during those first three weeks. And then trying to protect against those early winter weather events that hit the area, much like they did this year during the last two weeks of the season where everybody as, you know, those of you who have lived in Montana a while know back in the nineties, when we got weather, especially like in the fall of 92, 93, those elk got pounded. We hit, we shot thousands of elk. So that potential is still there. And you need, I would really urge you to be very careful as you change this. If you do change it, if you feel like you need to do something to give the outfitters more work, give some more business, I would encourage you to increase the number of limited permits. Um, but you are playing with fire in my, my 
opinion, if you open this up to unlimited harvest the last two weeks of the season with this kind of weather, um, once it, once that cat gets out of the bag or you know the horse gets out of the barn, it's really hard to turn it around, as you all know. Thank you, and uh, luck in your deliberations. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, next we have the MOGA office. Okay, uh, star six to unmute. Uh, thank you. Have you, uh, at my mic coming through? Yes, you are, go ahead. Okay, well, good morning to you. My name is Mac Menard. I'm the executive director with the Montana Outfitters and Guides Association. And um, I'd like to offer a comment in favor of the uh, proposed change. Um, this isn't really uh, an outfitter issue. And, and the reason it isn't is that it, in, in a five week season, if you have 25 clients, you're gonna run five a week. In a three week season, if you have 25 clients, you're just gonna change your, your model. So I, I wanna emphasize that we were looking at this largely as a public opportunity to hunt and what better place than a place that is largely federal public land under a general hunting season. And in addition to uh, its benefits in terms of, of providing a couple of weeks of additional hunting opportunity, it also seeks to reduce crowding in adjacent districts. So if there's anything we've learned in the dialogue over the last year on elk, it's that the demand for public land hunting, where, where hunting can take place on, on you know, a, a, a general tag and something that reduces crowding, um, seemed like a worthy mix to um, at least discuss. And so for those reasons, we're, we're supportive of this um, action. I was involved heavily in this thing back in 2015, 2015 and 16. And um, I don't think much, I don't think we believe this closure was gonna to amount to much of anything in terms of addressing the biological issues. And then looking at the most recent data, I think that conclusion is borne out. Um, so I guess in, in summary, uh, it seems like there's a, a, a biological surplus here it seems like it fits the bill for the opportunity to provide additional hunting and address crowding in adjacent districts. All right, your time is up. Thank okay. you. We support Thank the you. department's exercise in its authority on Deckard Flats if that were to come, come about. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair, Chair next we have Scott Vollmer. All right, go ahead. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Uh, for the record, my name is Scott Vollmer. That's V-O-L-L-M-E-R. And I live in Gallatin Gateway, and I'm here to testify on my own behalf today. Uh, just for starters, I fully support, or fully support restoring 313 back to that five-week general season. Um, what has been really crystal clear to me over the past year and a half and listening to all the deliberations on elk is that, that you, this commission and this department has been making a lot of efforts to provide as much access to the public to elk on public and on private land. And this change to me is just another example of that. Now, full disclosure, I don't hunt in 313, but I all hunt almost exclusively in region three. And to me, making this change provides more opportunity to relieve pressure and crowding in other region three HDs, uh, especially adjacent HDs. Uh, after what I just heard from region three, doesn't seem like there's a biological concern here. So making this change to me is purely addressing social issues, providing more opportunity and access for sportsmen. You're all aware that 313, as Mac just said, uh, has is predominantly public land. So the way I view this is, is not supporting this change to the, this district is akin to not supporting enhanced access and opportunities to pursue the public resource on public lands. And predominantly for that reason, I support this change and thank you for your time. Thank you. Madam Chair, next we have Randy Newberg. Um, star six. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Madam Chair, Vice Chair, fellow FWP commissioners, my name is Randy Newberg. I'm from Bozeman. 
Thank you for your time to provide comment today. I submitted written comment earlier. Uh, as commissioners, you are the seven most important wildlife trustees in Montana. The ability of this commission and the department to manage wildlife is dependent upon the trust hunters and anglers have in the commission. The process for a controversial amendment such as this without extensive public comment risks eroding the confidence that hunters and anglers have in the commission. Putting this amendment out there for more public comment is needed to retain the public's trust in the process and in this commission. The pertinent facts that need to be considered are Hunt Code 31345 was one of the most heated and controversial season structures in Region 3, maybe the entire state, over the last 20 years. We spent three months in the winter of 2015 and 16 in meetings at Gardner, Livingston, and Bozeman working through this issue. FWP told us that herd health was the issue being solved, not any mention of trophy bulls. The current season structure was a compromise that came from those public meetings. Today we have a December muzzleloader season in place that we did not have at the time this season structure was adopted in 2015 and 16. And we have bills currently under consideration by the upcoming legislature that could expand this muzzleloader season. Trust is a function of the optics of process. Whether one agrees or disagrees with this amendment, the reality is the optics of how this amendment came forth does influence the trust hunters and anglers have. Those are facts relevant to this process that was used to bring forth the amendment. The process by which amendments change a season that had months of public discussion in 2015 and 16 needs more public comment. I would ask that the commission reject the amendment at this time, and I would ask that you go through the same public process that was used in 2015 and 16 that resulted in the current season structure. This process ignores the perspective this current process ignores the perspectives of hundreds of hunters who engaged in this process in 2015 and 16. Thank, Thank you for you. your consideration. I would ask that you reject this amendment today and send it out for more public comment and consideration by the Region 3 hunters who are vested in this amendment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair, next we have Kevin Farron. Yeah, go ahead. Hello, Chair Robinson, members of the Commission. My name is Kevin Farron, and I'm the coordinator for the Montana chapter of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. First, we want to acknowledge the new and improved process we're dealing with here. Um, the outcry this recent 313 proposal has created really illustrates how problematic the previous process was with commissioners having the ability to amend proposals on the fly without any public notice at all. At least today, we had a little notice. <clears throat> that said, Vice Chair Tabor's 313 change is not really an amendment to FTP's proposal, and that's why this has created such heartburn. It's an entirely new and largely unrelated proposal to the others that deal with quota and district boundary corrections in completely different areas. That coupled with the controversial nature of this amendment leads us to politely ask that the commission please table the amendment today and either advance Vice Chair Tabor's ideas as its own new policy proposal to be voted on in February or ideally punt on this entirely until the next round of biennial season setting, which coupled with the new elk plan would ensure ample public engagement from all stakeholders on the significant change to Montana's hunting opportunities, something that even Vice Chair Tabor himself just mentioned he'd like to see happen. Thank you for the opportunity to comment, but before I close, I have to say, Commissioner Byworth, your beard looks a little bit grayer than when you first joined the commission. Mm -hmm. I hope that Montana BHA isn't solely responsible for that. And Commissioner <laughs> Waller, I hear that you're moving to Utah. I hope that Montana BHA didn't have anything to do with that either. In all seriousness, I'd like to again express our deep gratitude to both of you for your time and service. We wish you well on whatever the future holds. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, um, next we have Scott Countryman. Okay. okay, go ahead. Where'd he go? Oh, okay, star six, there we go. It should be unmuted. Yes, you are. Uh, I'd like to read um, what Commissioner Byra, uh, uh, Tabor submitted. It said, this comes out, uh, as I discussed at the August commission meeting, when the department disclosed there's no longer biological concerns about elk populations in this district, but the major reason for me proposing a decrease of the wolf quota for this district. The outfitting businesses, like the rest of the businesses, have been severely hurt due to the flooding. So I, I would give Mr. Tabor the opportunity if you would like to redact how he stated the justification for this. Um, but I also would like to say that if there are no longer any biological concerns in the district, then congratulations to the commission in 2016 for implementing a plan 
that removed all these biological concerns and to stay with the uh, district regulations as they are currently so that we don't have any biological concerns in the future. Lastly, the question of trophy versus opportunity is a, really a can of worms that if you try to open it, I guarantee you're gonna get a lot of different answers. I prefer you seek the question, what do the America, what do the Montana hunters look for in supporting the best interests of our big game management? You find that answer, you support it with biological solutions, and I think you'll have a lot less friction moving forward. Thank you so much. Oh, I did want to address the people in Gardner. We do have tools like damage hunts to help you if you are suffering from those types of concerns with your land. So there are solutions in place today for you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any more hands raised um, okay. for public comment at this time. Okay, and I got noticed that Region 2 has someone available and they were having trouble with their audio. Madam Chair, are you, are you able to hear us here? Yes. Yep, go okay, ahead. We have one, one comment from Region 2, please. <laughs> Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and fellow commissioners. I'm Jeff Dara. I'm the executive director of Montana Sportsmen for Fish and Wildlife. Uh, I simply would like to say that we support Commissioner Tabor's amendment. Um, I'm looking at the Montana 2022 elk counts for 313. The elk plan objective was 4,000 elk. And on this document, it says the most recent elk count of 2022 was 5,473 elk. That's 37% above objective. I'm a public land hunter and I want to hunt those elk. So we support Senator or uh, Commissioner Tabor's amendment. Uh, thank you and have a good Christmas. Thank you. All right, I'm going to ask the regions one more time to make sure that we are not missing anyone. Okay. Are there any comments, or Commissioner Tabor? Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I do have some follow-up questions for the department um, because I want to clarify a, n a number of things. There, there were some excellent comments that came out of both the um, comments submitted in writing as well as some of the testimony today. So, so one of them is the concern about Decker Flax and when those elk first come out, is there a mechanism in place now where the department can can prevent any kind of wholesale slaughter? Um, or is that something that we need to adjudicate to create that level of protection? Madam Chair, uh, Vice Chair uh, Tabor, my understanding is that we do have a mechanism in place where we can address that currently. Thank you, Madam Chair. Follow up. Um, there's comments on muzzle loader, and um, so, and I and I know that it's we probably don't even have the data in because it's so doggone new. But do we have any sense for what's happening with muzzle loader and the impact down in that area? Is there uh, any feedback at all? And I know that it's uh, brand new, but just curious as to what, what we're observing, or perhaps region three knows this. Uh, Madam chair, uh, vice chair Tabor. Um, I, I think that we probably only have uh, some anecdotal information, but I'm going to defer to region three and Mike, Michael Yarnell one more time and uh, see if he has some additional information. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Tabor, uh, currently the muzzleloader season for this season, which just passed, uh, has only been valid for those tags which were valid at the end of the general season. And that means only those tags uh, or permit, special permits drawn for the last two weeks of the general season. So, uh, there's a there's a difference in uh, that potential harvest versus a uh, general season, uh, five week general season, which would then make the general license valid during the 
uh, muzzleloader season. So uh, we don't know exactly, but we would expect that there would be increased muzzleloader season harvest. Uh, but exactly how much without having uh, seen that, uh, had any experience with that season structure uh, would be hard to predict, but we would expect more harvest. Uh, Madam Chair, can I ask a clarifying question to Mike? Yeah, go ahead. So, so Mike, so I, I think if I understood you correctly, what you're saying is the only people eligible to use muzzleloader in 313 were the special permit holders for the last two weeks of the season. The original three week general season people were not eligible to use those, those their, or any other general license holder is not eligible. Only the special permit people in 313 are eligible for muzzleloader. Commissioner Tabor, that's correct under this current season structure. Thank you, I appreciate that clarification. Any further questions or comments? Madam Chair, I did, oh yeah, go ahead, Pat. Yeah, go ahead, Commissioner Byer. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, as a Region 3 Commissioner, I guess the spirit of the amendment, I, 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 I guess I'm neutral on, it may be a great idea, uh, but my perspective is that we just went through a fairly bruising and complex regulation cycle with a lot of public involvement that lasted over several months. And uh, this one, uh, having seen, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how many of the emails that came to me also came to you, but the ratio uh, was clearly about 10 to one against. So without uh, kind of uh, overwhelming public support, uh, of this kind of interim change. I think it's a little too complex to advance at this time. I can't support it. Uh, just, I mean, recall that this is on the boundary of the park and, and Mr. Johnson, Edward Johnson uh, mentioned, you know, the, the park service has a, a bunch of habitat for this elk herd and it varies uh, drastically season to season. I think it's maybe time for the commission to consider and FWP to consider uh, kind of reviving and uh, reigniting that uh, coordinating group down there to make sure we're communicating well. Uh, it may be, uh, well, I should say that I, I completely agree with uh, increasing opportunity and making it available. I think right now it's just premature and I can't really uh, support the amendment. Okay. Thank you. Any other um, questions or comments? Commissioner, Vice Chair Tabor, did you have something more? Sure. I do, but I see that uh, Commissioner Siebel okay. has his hand up, so. All right, go ahead, Commissioner Siebel. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I guess uh, I had a follow-up question for the department I wanted to ask, because I know we saw some comments about Dome Mountain Wildlife Management Area, specifically with regards to the muzzleloader season. And if I'm not mistaken, like like uh, Deckard Flats, I believe that that area is closed in the, uh, it's either closed in late season. I, I just wanted to clarify that with the department, because I think it's important. And, uh, I, and I also believe Dome Mountain Ranch. If I understood, yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm sorry. Go ahead, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Siebel. If I understood your question correctly, um, it is closed to entry at that time. Okay. Uh, and Commissioner Commissioner Siebel, can I add a yeah. clarification to what Brian just said? Because you asked about two separate areas. So you asked about Dome Mountain WMA that. It does have the traditional seasonal closure that most of our WMAs that are established for big game winter range have. So that area is closed to public entry. Uh, you also asked about Deckard Flats. That area is not closed to public entry. Uh, the department does not own that. There is in uh, the current regulations, uh, uh, a closure area that can be implemented across Deckard Flats um, for an emergency closure, um, uh, as people have mentioned earlier. So I just wanted to add that clarification so that everyone would, would know that. Thank you. Uh, follow up, Madam Chair. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just a follow up comment. I, I, just to address a little bit about what Commissioner Byer said, you know, I, I first I want to thank the public, and we, we did get really good public comment. I know there's been 
as I mentioned earlier, criticism about the process, but this is our process now that, that uh, the amendment was out. It was mentioned in, in August, uh, Commissioner uh, or, or Vice Chair Tabor did say specifically that he was going to, to present this and uh, at, at this meeting. And so I just wanted to point that out. And uh, I also appreciate, uh, you know, I appreciate the number of comments. I, it, it, like in the past though, the form letters and, and, and it's pretty easy once you read, you know, a few hundred emails, you can start seeing the same themes coming up, which, which I appreciate, but uh, I don't count the form letters myself as far as like numbers, but uh, th this situation in particular, I think that what we heard from the department is, you know, that, that, and I guess I'm still confused as to the reason why this was put in place, whether it was for uh, population restoration or was it for bull? Uh, and I heard from the department, I think that it was for, for uh, trophy quality. So uh, I'm still a little bit confused about it, but as I understand the population, this, this hasn't had any impact on trophy quality and the population is, is increased and, and is stable right now. So I'm still supportive of this amendment uh, in, from the standpoint of, you know, I'd like to see more opportunities for the public to be able to hunt in this area. We saw comments about pressure on 314 and other areas around when the, in the last two weeks of the season because people can't hunt in 313. And uh, I think that uh, we should take some of those to heart. So I, I, I still support this amendment that I second. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the commission? Madam Chair. Go ahead, Commissioner Tabor. So I, I, I just wanna kind of summarize what I what I heard are some key comments and, and things coming both out of the written comments as well as, as what I heard today. Um, I am particularly concerned about muzzle loader and how that, because I, I don't know that we, any of us all knew. And so um, really understanding what muzzleloader impact it has and then the cause and effect and in, in, in interrelationship between general season and muzzleloader season. I, I think one of the things that, that I will really look to the department to do for uh, the next biennials will, will be in these special areas where they are corridors, travel corridors and everything else if they are susceptible to creating a really unfair advantage as a result of weather, um, that I believe it's within our authority to, to perhaps say, okay, muzzleloader is good, except for a district or two where it just doesn't appear responsible to allow it to happen. So I, I'd, like, I'd like the department to comment on that. Uh, there was one letter in particular that was really profound where it talked about the unintended consequences of what doing this in 313 had. So, so looking at the bigger region, what, what has happened is it, it, you know, when you pulled close the last two weeks of 313, then all the surrounding districts, there was a, a fairly significant uptick of hunter participation there. So they're, it's not that they're not coming, they're just not going to the one area that they used to go. So they go someplace else. So then that created crowding issues in other districts. But one of the really interesting impacts that, that somebody commented on was the impact to other species, including in particular mule deer. And I think you all know how I feel about mule deer. Um, and so from the standpoint that now, you know, mule deer are intensely getting hit in certain other districts because we've had hunter disbursement. That to me is a pretty profound, you know, cause and effect for perhaps unintended consequences. You know, I, I think we heard today and both in the letters, uh, this, this interesting dynamic between opportunity. Um, you know, we have two major sportsman groups that are on opposite sides of this topic today, which is probably true of a lot of different things. Um, and so as I think about that, it, it is so important for us as we move into the elk management plan that we have sound surveying. So we really understand what the, the overall ethic is for hunting elk and then use that as a, as a manner to inform us in the, in the plan. I'm hoping that if we are gonna get to, to identifying hunting districts as trophy, which I believe is appropriate, obviously not all of them, obviously not none of them, but some proportion of the districts throughout the state of Montana, that we do that in a manner that is really fair and equitable to everyone. And we weigh the difference between opportunity and, and trophy because both matter to citizens um, and we have to get that right in the next next deal. What is compelling to me and, and I think um, is consistent with the way I've looked at this, it, it's the way I looked at the fishing um, plan and some of the original um, motions that were made for, 
fishing is. I do like to plan um, first and execute second. Um, the only reason that I wanted to do this for 23 is because I wanted to give an extra year of hunting opportunity to the public hunters. That's, that's quite frankly, is precisely why I wanted to do it. So if the public hunters would, you know, can wait one more year. And if we do ultimately get to a different solution for creating more opportunity in this district, you know, we'll, we'll find that out as we go through it. So based on everything that I've heard, um, Madam Chair, I'm going to withdraw my motion um, because I think what I'd like to do is defer to have this conversation as part of, of the elk management plan. The most important aspect that I wanted to accomplish was, and that is a good dialogue. And I hope the department has been taking copious notes and that it informs the department of some of the componentry that needs to, to be resident in the elk management plan and, and specificity in particular, because I want to get to prescription in this upcoming plan. So I respectfully withdraw my motion. Commissioner Siebel. Uh, Madam Chair, before, uh, since I seconded the motion, before I withdraw the motion, I'd like to uh, ask Vice Chair Tabor if he would entertain, I believe it was uh, a former Commissioner Vermillion or former Chairman Vermillion that brought up, actually, I thought it was a good idea, maybe as a, as a interim compromise uh, to propose perhaps that we increase the number of special permits as a as a stopgap or a bridge between now and, and our elk planning in the next season or in the next biennial season center. Just wondered if you would consider that. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Siebel, you know, I, I think what, what I think would be appropriate is I, I'll withdraw my motion as I made it. Um, and then if you want to make a motion to do that, I probably could support it. And I'd like to hear from the other commissioners if they could support it. Um, I'm about wanting to increase opportunity right now. Um, and it feels like giving more opportunities for hunters in that last two weeks seems very appropriate, especially if we're not harming it. So I like that concept. Um, but I think from a rules of order perspective, it's best that I just pull mine down and a new one come up. I agree. So I'll officially withdraw my second time, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Walsh. I just wanted to add that I really appreciate the dialogue this morning. And for me, at least as a commissioner, it's really set up, um, you know, some expectations of what we'll be dealing with next fall. And, and I, again, like the other commissioners, I'd like to help do whatever I can to create a sense of urgency around the elk management plan and the importance of it in helping inform us in coming up with better regulations and policy. Um, in terms of expanding the, the, the number of special permits for next fall, I'd only ask a little more time on that and, and get the response from uh, Mr. Wakeling and his staff and uh, just ask that uh, Commissioner Siebel consider that for the February meeting, if that allows us enough time. Yes, that would be a question for Helena is is the February meeting early enough to make that kind of a change? Um, Madam Chair, members of the commission, uh, currently we have a contractual date to, to send the regulations to the printer on January 12th. Um, one of the options is always um, to uh, consider a, uh, um, you know, we could, we could change a uh, quota and have that uh, posted on the uh, the internet. And uh, currently, uh, the way our regulations have been printed in the past, oftentimes there is a uh, quota change that may occur after printing. And so um, if a quota change does occur, um, it, it certainly is something that we can address online, but it's uh, it, it would be uh, past the, uh, the scheduled printing date. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Byarth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I wondered, uh, I know that 313 is not on the amendments to the quota range, but I do believe there is a quota range that exists that was adopted uh, by the commission already. Uh, Mr. Wakeling or or uh, Mr. Yarnell, do you, are you aware of what that quota range is as exists now? 
Um, Madam Chair, members of the commission, um, I do not have it right in front of me. However, it is something that I could get within about five minutes. Um, uh, Michael Yarnell, I, I'm not certain if you happen to have that in front of you. Brian and Chair Robinson, we need a minute to look up that information real quick. Apologies. Thank you. Madam Chair, while we're waiting for uh, that information to be gathered, can I ask another question of the department? Yes, go ahead. Um, and really, this is for the entire director's office, you know, and, and I somewhat, um, is there a, a, a number of permits where from a materiality standpoint, we wouldn't have any significant impact one way or the other? You know, if for instance, and I don't know what Commissioner Siebel is thinking about in terms of an increase, I, I'm sure it's not going to go from 50 to 1500 or something like that. It's probably going to be relatively modest, but is there a, a number of permits where we can create more opportunity for the public and still not feel like we're um, getting the cart before the horse in terms of planning and some other things? I, I would like to hear uh, what Commissioner Byerth asked, what, what the range is where we're at now and what, what where, where the max range is. But Commissioner Siebel? Well, I'm Madam Chair, I just want oh, okay. go ahead. Okay. Three, four, two, four. Um, Madam Chair, members of the commission, um, the uh, quota range that was approved by the commission uh, for 31445, uh, it sure. ranges between 25 and 100. So currently it's at 50. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, you said 31445? Three, three, yeah. 313 is what. Yes. Is that right? Okay, let me try that again. 313.45, that is 50, and its range is 25 to 100. Um, Same. Apologize. Same thing. Yeah. Okay. So, Mr. Siebel. Uh, Madam Chair, yeah, based on that, and since we've adopted that, I was thinking a little higher number. I wanted to make a comment that given the, given the drawing statistics, that anything we do, if we double the number of permits to 100, it doubles the chances. But uh, you know, there's there's so many people to put in for this tag anyway. It's going to be it'll it'll still increase opportunities. So, I guess either now or in writing prior to the February meeting, uh, you know, I would I would definitely consider putting in and submitting an amendment to increase the the quota to the high end of the quota range for 313.45. Madam Chair, oops, go ahead, uh, Brian, go ahead. Madam Chair. Uh, That's the director. Okay, yeah, go Chair, ahead. <laughs> we can, yeah, we can go to 100 without even commissioner, without your, your approval on this. But can the commission direct uh, the FWP to increase it to that? That certainly is within the, the scope of the commission's authority to, to do so. Um, and I, I believe the question, if one of the questions I believe is on the table is uh, what if, what would that have, what effect would that have if, if we increase the quota from 50 to 100, if I understood uh, Commissioner Siebel correctly. Um, and again, as we noted in our original uh, response to the, the, uh, um, the, pro the, the, amend the amendment offered by um, Commissioner Tabor, um, we do not believe that that would have a biological effect on the population. Um, what is likely to occur is that we would see some incremental increase in the harvest that could have a, 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 a change in the, uh, the mean or the average uh, age structure of the population. But it's, it's, not, um, it's not likely to be measurable uh, from our perspective, I would certainly uh, there's certainly some uh, impact that would occur, and it could also have that effect on the uh, the muzzleloader season. Commissioner Byers, oh, you're on mute still. 
<laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. My uh, my question was largely answered uh, as to 313-45, the, uh, the, uh, the bull license, but what about 313-00? There's a quota, I believe, and I have the draft regulation, so I'm not certain about this, that there were 60 antler list tags in 313-00. Uh, would the commission be agreeable to raising that as well, which would also increase uh, public uh, access and opportunity? Absolutely. Commissioner okay. Siebel. No, oh, Madam Chair, I was gonna respond to Commissioner Barth, absolutely. And, and I'd like to ask the department what the quarter range for the 313-00 permits is. Um, Madam Chair, members of the commission, um, the, the quota range will go up to 100 for the 313-00 as well. Uh, commissioners, if, if I could offer a, a clarification uh, on that antlerless opportunity. Go ahead. Um, that, so there was a change made to that uh, during the last season setting process as part of the simplification directive uh, to uh, eliminate quotas that were for deer and elk that were uh, less than 50. Prior to this uh, past season, we had an opportunity for youth hunters uh, for 30, uh, ant they were antlerless elk permits, not bee licenses, um, and then 30 for um, uh, that anyone could apply for. So uh, there's an opportunity for adults. Um, that change was made uh, late during the uh, season setting process last year to uh, both accommodate uh, the directive to eliminate uh, the, those quotas that were less than 50 uh, but also to respond to uh, public uh, concern over the loss of that youth opportunity. Uh, this is something that we've considered uh, in the region for adjustment uh, during the, the next season setting to provide uh, some opportunity again for, for both uh, adults and youth uh, in 313. And so that could look like a, a few different things, but one thing that we've talked about would be simply, uh, you know, having uh, a quota of 50 for adults and 50 uh, for youth, which would uh, be quite similar to what we had uh, in the past. So I just wanted to offer that clarification. Commissioner Walsh. Thanks, Chair Robinson. Um, I just had a question for either Commissioner Byork or for the department. And that's that's what's going on with damage hunts in 313 and 314. Uh, Commissioner, have you approved damage hunts? Commissioner Walsh, uh, Madam Chair, I don't believe we've uh, had any special management hunts or game damage hunts in hunting district 313. Although there are uh, some brucellosis related hunts uh, immediately to the north uh, in a portion of uh, 317, I believe. But Mike, Michael Yarnell can certainly correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Walsh, um, we have not had any uh, game damage hunts in 313 or 314 uh, this season. Um, 314, most of it is under a shoulder season. Uh, so um, that uh, in a lot of ways eliminates uh, the, the calls for any game damage hunts. 313, uh, as we've discussed previously, is primarily uh, federally owned public land. Um, and so that in part uh, reduces uh, the call for uh, game damage hunts in 313. 
Commissioner Siebel? I, oh, go ahead. You know, I was, I was just re reflecting on the comments that we received from the Teton Ranch folks. Uh, Commissioner Walls, we've, we've not had uh, any, the, the Royal Teton Ranch has not reached out uh, to FWP regarding uh, game damage this season or in recent prior seasons. Um, that I suspect that's probably uh, due to um, previous conversations that, that have been had uh, related to eligibility uh, in the game damage program. Commissioner Siebel. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, just a follow-up question for Mike. Uh, looking at the, uh, I'm looking at the actual regulations that we, we passed from last year. And, and just to clarify, 31300, there's 60, and it's youth-only cow tags. 31700 is the only opportunity for adults currently in, in uh, Region 313 for cows, but it's only good north of, of Doe Mountain Wildlife Management Area, as I read it, including the shoulder season. So, uh, just curious, and, and, and I guess procedurally, Madam Chair, if we were to to do this interim change, which again increasing opportunities, but still still having some limits uh, until we get through the, the the larger planning process, I'd like to understand what the process would be if we could have uh, Region Three may, maybe make more recommendations or and, and then consider those in February, or if we should consider those today. I'm happy to make a motion today to vote on that recommendation to make that change today if if, if it makes sense. But a lot of questions there, but I'd like to clarify the that the antlerless hunting that, that exists currently in 313, as I understand it. Uh, Commissioner Siebel, you're correct. Um, the, however, that portion of 313 north of Doe Mountain WMA, uh, essentially that includes uh, uh, a small portion of 313 in three the 317 shoulder season. And that shoulder season uh, is primarily intended uh, as a uh, distribution tool rather than a uh, population reduction tool. And that's, that's intended to provide a tool to uh, address brucellosis transmission risk and minimize commingling between elk and cattle. Thank you, follow up, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Uh, I'd just like to ask for, for clarification from you or the department on, on the best way to proceed with. I, I would like to I'd like to uh, consider increasing the quota range on 313.45 to the to the upper end of the range. I, I would make that motion and also increase the uh, recommend that we increase the antlerless elk hunting opportunities uh, in, in this region as a as a stopgap measure until the full season setting next year. So it wouldn't be the quota range or um, the number of uh, permits? Yeah, permits. yeah, the actual permits within the, within the existing quarter range. Yes, sorry, Madam Chair. Yep. I would entertain a motion if you want to make a motion. Uh, one more follow-up question for Mike, please. Sure, sure, go ahead. Uh, Mike, just a follow-up on the on the uh, elk B licenses we currently have. If we were to include adults, would that be a change in the uh, in, in the uh, uh, three thirteen zero zero take? to also include a quota for uh, adults above the age of 15? Um, so uh, I'll let Brian follow up here in case uh, he wants to offer more clarifications, but um, uh, I believe it would be, would be within the you know commission's authority to either change that, uh, that license to allow adults to apply for that license um, or to make other changes. Um, I, when I offered the clarifications earlier, I, I wasn't trying to you know, propose a, a change to, for consideration uh, now, although if uh, the commission wishes to do so, uh, you could, but I was just wanted to explain that those are things that we've considered uh, to uh, update during the next season setting to try to uh, accommodate some of the, the concerns which we weren't able to accommodate uh, during uh, last season setting process. Follow up, Manager. Go ahead. Um, 
Mr. Wakeling, can you can you comment on that? I guess looking at the the last thing I want to do is take away any youth opportunities. Uh, so I certainly like to leave those in place or even increase that if we wanted to add uh, in, in you know biologically. I guess uh, you know I'm talking about adding additional cow hunting opportunities here in the interim. Uh, would would we create a 31301 that would be available for adults or anybody, and then leave the 31300 as a as a youth hunt? I may be getting too far over my skis here too and asking for too much on short notice. Certainly, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Siebel, um, uh, all, all it would require <clears throat> is for you to clearly um, articulate um, what, uh, um, and we may, uh, so you, what is the the three fourteen forty five? What would you like 313. to see that photo set at? Three thirteen. I'm sorry, three thirteen forty five. I keep doing that. Three thirteen forty five, um, and then the three thirteen zero zero. Would you like to see that at? And if we would like to establish a new LPT, that would be a three thirteen for the uh, um, for the youth. Um, then that would be a, a new um, three thirteen. Um, it, it could be dash oh one. Um, and then what the quota that you would like to see for that. And uh, that's clearly articulated. We can incorporate that. Okay. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, I propose that we increase the uh, increase the permanent amount in Hunting District 313-45 from 50 to 100. Um, so that we- Do you wanna start your motion with the, are you gonna, uh, incorporate. Oh, yes. This is an amendment. This is an amendment to the the current motion as written by the department. Sure, that you switch. You probably should start with that. I'll have to bring that back up. I'm sure. I've got it right here. Okay, uh, Madam Cheryl Sardo. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I move the Fish and Wildlife Commission adopt the amendments to the license permit type quotas and quota ranges and hunting district legal descriptions as presented by the department in this cover sheet and accompanying amendment sheet with the following amendment. Uh, increase the number of elk permits in hunting district 313-45 from 50 to 100. In uh, change the uh, uh, change the uh, description for hunting district 313-00 uh, to be open to any applicant for antlerless fee. Uh, for 60 and keep the quota the same at 60. And add an additional LPT of 313.01 or as, as determined by the department that creates an additional 60 tag antlerless elk opportunity for youth ages 12 to 15. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, Commissioner Lane, second it. Okay, um, I just want to go back to Brian just to make sure that that is um, everything, if all the information that you need in that motion. Uh, Madam Chair, I believe we do. Um, I see at least two two nodding heads, so I think uh, I think we've got all the information we need. Okay. Uh, we're hearing this as a final today. We're hearing this as a final today. Yes. Yes. So my yes. next my next question is uh, do we have to go back out for public comment? This was brought up in public comment, but it is different from what was proposed. Are we um, as I understand it, uh, good from the uh, from legal is we probably should take it back out for public comment. Okay. All right. So Ma Madam Chair, go ahead. I, Commissioner I had a, I had a uh, question for both uh, Commissioner Siebel and, and the department. If I understood correctly, what's within the realm of already existing uh, quota ranges for the cow tags, it went up to 50. And so where I thought you were going to go with it was 50 and 50, 50 adult, 50 youth. Um, and I, I, and I don't know if this also remedies 
the issue of going to public comment because this is always this is completely within the realm of what is already on the books. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I don't know if that modification, not that I don't want to hear from the public, believe me, I, I do, and, and maybe we just do it anyway, but my point is you kind of increased it by 20, and I don't know if that was your intent or not, uh, Commissioner Siebel, so I'm just asking you. Madam Chair. Commissioner Siebel. Uh, yes, and, and great point, uh, Vice Chair Tabor, and I guess I, I'd, like to, I'd like to amend my amendment to my motion to uh, change the, the quota from 31300, which is the adult BTEG, to 40, and, and then keep the youth, uh, youth 12 to 15 quota at 60. So we stay within the 100 uh, range of the original intent. That okay, and then, so then, then there wouldn't be a 31301? No, there's still, we're still splitting them, but what now, instead of 60 and 60, it'll be 40 uh, for everyone and then 60 for the youth, because I don't want to take away youth hunting opportunities. Okay. Is that clear? Is, okay, Commissioner Lane, you have a I second. I was that second. Okay. All right. So back to legal. Since we did not go above the quota, is it still something that we go out to public on this? Chair Robinson, this is Quentin. The uh, there is requirement to go out to the. There is a change here be outside of the quota range, and that's for the additional set of B licenses. So for that reason alone. Um, we've already talked about this being outside of the conversation, so smart to take it back to public comment. And you can't rely, again, that piece it doesn't have a quota range, and in fact, that LPT doesn't exist right now in the book. So for that structure change that we've, we've essentially incorporated in the conversation, it is prudent to go to public comment here with an eye to this being a final decision today. Madam Chair. Okay. okay. I will um, go back out to public comment. If uh, Hunter, is there anyone available who would like to comment on the current motion? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if anyone has any words of public comment, could they please raise their hand? Um, it looks like we have the Montana Wildlife Federation. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Madam Chair, members of the commission, again, this is Marcus Strange representing the Montana Wildlife Federation. Um, thank you for the opportunity to weigh in here. I first want to uh, thank specifically Commissioner Tabor, uh, as well as the rest of you for really trying to strike a compromise here. Um, I recognize this is probably not you know, where you wanted to go with this, but I appreciate very much your willingness to listen to the public. Um, I, I guess my concern here is with the with this new proposal, um, I'm still trying to wrap my head around this in you know the last couple of minutes that I'm hearing this. You know, we just feel like changes like this, uh, well, in your purview, probably would be better served um, with more time for the public to think about it rather than on the fly here. So we would again, um, you know, ask that we just stick with the current structure, give the public time to consider these things so that we can give you informed feedback. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, we have Kevin Farron. Okay. Go ahead. Chair Robinson, members of the commission. Um, my name is Kevin Farron again with the Montana chapter of BHA. And I kind of want to echo what Marcus just said. Um, first of all, thank you, Commissioner Tabor. Like, really appreciate that you recognize that this conversation, you know, is probably best suited to to deserve you know, a little more public conversation. Um, and I, I appreciate that you withdrew your amendment for that very, very reason. However, I find it kind of troubling and a little bit backwards that we immediately followed up that recognition with then a different proposal to change the quotas. Um, I, again, I, I, you know, our organization is not necessarily against that. We're not necessarily for that, but I think without question, we can all recognize why that too definitely warrants a little bit more of a conversation. So I really hope if anything, you guys put this out for public comment and not make a final decision on that sort of thing today. Um, I just feel like there's a lot of confusion with the numbers and it it just seems kind of a weird rushed compromise. Um, and while I appreciate what we're trying to do here, I just think there's a cleaner way to go about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, we have Ken Sine. 
star six to unmute. Hi, I presume I'm here. Yep, go ahead. Thank you. Ken Sine, Bozeman, Montana. Um, since we're taking more public uh, comment, and I appreciate this opportunity by all means, I also appreciate Commissioner Tabor's uh, 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 modification of his proposal. Um, I'm very concerned. I am appreciative of the opportunity to make public comment, but I do want you to know that I did register to make comments uh, initially. In other words, when the proposal was first brought up and opened up to public comment, and I was not called on. So I do feel that my opportunity to make comment was um, not, just wasn't there. So in other words, there's been lots of comment about the process, and I registered yesterday, I feel like I did everything correctly, but again, I was not called upon, not given the opportunity to comment during the initial public discussion or opportunity for the public to comment in relation to this proposal in 313. Um, the idea of postponing it, the idea of putting it out for more public comment is always good to me, but that is the primary thing that I wanted to comment on right now. Um, I just want to remind everyone too, though, when we ask for comments, you just need to make sure that your hand is raised because that's the only way we know who wants to comment at that time. So are there any further commenters? Yes, Madam Chair, we have the MOGA office. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman, members of the commission. Um, I find I appreciate the efforts that you guys are, are undertaking here to uh, to find some space here. I think the the number of permits that we're talking about, and I think the way um, this is is coming about. I, I guess I would offer caution at this point. Um, I, I appreciate the intent. I fully appreciate the uh, effort. But, but quite honestly, I think at this stage of the game, I would, I would join with others and, and, and just suggest caution. I'm, I'm not sure we need to move this ahead as quickly on, on this scale as we were originally talking about uh, uh, a general season for two weeks. And now um, we're, we're talking about entering into an adjustment to the permitting system. So that would be my feeling on it, uh, you know, encourage you to vote your conscience on it and move it forward. But at this point, um, I just uh, encourage some, some, take some time on it and, and let this one, let this one ride. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have uh, Mike here for public comment. Okay, star six. Star six to unmute. Still muted. Okay, Mike, if you need to put, oh, there you go. There you go. Hi, go. hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Yeah, my, my name's Mike Spatorno, I'm calling from Helena. I'm, uh, I'm just commenting on, uh, on my own. Uh, I guess the amendment's been taken care of because I was totally against that. But anyway, I have some comments on area 313 in general. Is Can I uh, bring those up? Yes, uh, there's a two-minute time limit, so yes, go ahead. Remember, there's only there are only three brow tine yeah. bulls for 100 cows. Mm -hmm. that, you should keep that in mind. And why don't we try a six point rule in that area? And another, and another thing I'd like to see is uh, uh, for area 313, why don't we try to do in area uh, 313, the same thing that's happening in area 380, the Elkhorns by Helena. The general public would still have opportunity and at the same time have a healthy herd of older broke brow tine bulls and uh another thing i needed to bring up is a, a healthy herd needs at least 10 to 12 brow tine bulls per 100 cows and th this hasn't happened 
uh, a normal brow tine bull count hasn't happened since two, 2002. Uh, but anyway, what I'd like to see in area 313 also is more, more elk in the area and also an opportunity for more larger, older brow tine bulls. Uh, let me see what else do I have here wrote down. Hmm. I guess that's all I have for right now, but thank okay, you thank very you. much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Hmm. Madam Chair, we have uh, Jock Cunningham. Star six, there you go, go ahead. Yep. Hi, um, thank you for this opportunity to speak and thank you to commissioners uh, Waller and Byer for your tough service, your um, hard duty. I uh, wanna thank commissioner uh, Tabor for withdrawing his amendment. Um, I think that's responsive and praiseworthy. And uh, in general, I was against the amendment and support the comments of BHA and MWF and Randy Newberg. I'd, I'd still like to point out that what we heard from Region 3 was with low calf recruitment numbers, low bull cow ratio. And respectfully to me, even um, the suggested uh, increase in, in uh, permits represents a 100% increase. And that's significant. Um, in in that kind of scenario, and in a year when we've looked at very poor forage um, production and potentially high winter stress, so I'd, I I also support um, youth hunt numbers, and I'd I'd ask the commission to kid, consider that if there is an increase, that it go to the youth hunters, um, and that it be on the order of seventy five tags total instead of a hundred. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have uh, Mike Mershon. Okay, go ahead. Madam. Oops. Oh, yeah, I think you, you uh, muted yourself. There you go. Okay. There we go, am I back? <laughs> yep, you're back. All right. Thank, thanks. Thanks so much, guys, for the for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'm I'm having a little difficulty pulling up the exact numbers I was looking for, but the general gist is that this uh, northern herd has remained relatively stable for um, you know maybe the last seven or eight years or so, and that stability has landed right around um, the upper end of the uh, quota range or uh, of the uh, elk plan. And so I just offer, um, you know, maybe maybe a deeper look at at the impacts of increasing cow take on the herd, um, perhaps echoing what everybody else has has spoken up for on on maybe we just need a deeper a deeper look at the impacts that we're proposing here today. Um, so that's all I'm that's all I'm offering. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair, I see no more hands raised for a comment at this time. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone in the regional offices to comment? Okay. Commissioner Lane. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, I support kind of what what Commissioner Siebel is putting forth in and through this comment, just, just in the few comments we just heard, I think there is there is a good point about maybe we need to look at this a little bit closer than than making a quick judgment as far as, you know, what's the right number. I, I think there's a lot of merit to it, but are we at the right number as far as raising our quota numbers? And so I, I just wanted to make that comment that I think there's some merit behind both increasing the uh, quotas, but also maybe taking the time to find out what the right quota would be. Thank so, you. I just need a clarification. We are not raising the quotas. We're raising the permits. We are the staying permits. within the quota range. Raising Correct. I apologize. It's just, yeah. Yep. Commissioner Siebel. 
Uh, Madam Chair, I actually was going to ask to hear from the other commissioners, and it looks like I'm going to get my wish here, but okay. I did want to make just a couple of quick comments. Number one, uh, you know, I knew going out and, and making this motion would, would go out, to, you know, it was likely to end up public comment again. I'm glad we did that. We got to hear from new people that, that hadn't commented earlier. I think that's really important from perspective. I also wanted to just point out that that this commission uh, by, by certain groups has been criticized in the past for having, you know, being accused of making up our mind beforehand and all these other things. And you're seeing the process now, which is, you know, uh, you know, th this is sausage making, this is how, you know, this is how we make decisions. And this is a great process. So I just want to bring, you know, making changes and discussing these like we're doing right now is a great part of the process. And, 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 you know, I just want to, uh, that it, it's in response to those, that criticism we've gotten in the past that this is sausage making, you're seeing it happen in, live and, and I appreciate the uh, everyone's effort. Commissioner Walsh. Thanks Chair Robinson. I'm exactly where I was before that I would uh, request that uh, Commissioner Siebel withdraw his amendment so we can uh, vote on the uh, motion at hand and move on. I, I just feel like um, the uh, staff, Mr. Wakeling and his staff have the room to move this uh, permit number up if they feel like it's warranted. And um, and I just don't feel uh, prepared to support this amendment in any way today. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Byers. I, I just echo exactly what uh, Commissioner Walsh said. I think uh, relying on Mike, uh, based on his post winter surveys and the department staff to work within their uh, existing authority uh, might be the better course of action rather than uh, in, uh, creating a new permit today. Thank you. Commissioner Tabor. Um, I, I just want to reiterate the fact that what we're doing here really isn't actually something new. It's just encouraging the department to go to what already is on the books to the, to the highest level. I, I do understand that we are creating a, a new cow tag, but there's already the authority to go up to a hundred cow tags through the quota. So this, this kind of indication that, Hey, we're really throwing something new and, and shooting from the hip and all that. Um, but, but I also feel pretty compelled at this point you know, from the standpoint of, of all the consternation. Uh, that's why I asked the question of the department would it make a material difference? It, it reminds me a little bit the last time we had this conversation, we were kind of splitting hairs. Is 50 or 100 elk, you know, as a, as a percentage of 6,000 elk, really going to make a difference one way or the other? Um, it will make a lot of difference to the people that put in for the tags and get the opportunity because only 50 lucky souls got that opportunity in what is arguably one of the greatest places in, in, in public public land hunting. So that's what really compels me to support this. Um, if the department comes back and says, you know, and, and I guess I'd like to hear from both Mike and I'd like to hear from the department. If they say, you know, we'd like to hear, we'd like to see those surveys. We'd like to see the impact of, of the muzzle loading season. Um, and we would also like to just have another year, then that would compel me to wait on this. Otherwise, I really like the idea of getting the public some more opportunity. And I, I feel like this is an insignificant increase and within the realm of our authority that's already been authorized. Brian, would you like to uh, comment to that? Madam Chair, I'm sorry, this is Quentin. I, I have the mic on my end. So before I hand oh, sure. off, I, if I may, uh, and I'll ask, uh, I'll, I'll take a first stab at the question that Vice Chair Tabor has posed uh, to the department. So I'll speak in a programmatic context, context if I may. You know, yeah, the, the number 50 relative to the population size, as Vice Chair Tabor points out, yeah, it, it, is, it is easy to make a first assumption that that's not going to be a significant uh, or long lasting impact um, applied in an annual uh, hunting season for this coming year. Um, I would also add that uh, if I hear the question, what would the department rather do in its process? We would rather, and the timing, especially for B license quota numbers, comes after our annual winter survey efforts. So um, uh, that doesn't, I don't mean for those to be contradictory. contradictory. One is 
What are those numbers? The second piece of my answer is what would our preferred typical process look like? And we'd make quota range adjustments after those winter surveys. Madam Chair, Vice Chair. I'll pass it off to the region. They may have something to add. Region three. Uh, Madam Chair, we are turning on our camera. Okay. We agree with Quentin's comments. Unless there are further questions, we have nothing else to add. Okay, thank you. Go ahead and just leave that on until we're done with this conversation, please. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Siebel. Madam Chair, just listening to the department, uh, you know, I, I would agree. I think I think the motion that I made is within within the current uh, quota ranges that are approved for the area. However, uh, you know, the listening to the fact that, that the B quotas are set after the winter surveys, which are being conducted now, I appreciate the fact that this might be a little sudden. I was, you know, my attempt to to try to compromise to expand opportunities. Uh, you know, we were considering opening this up totally to general season the last two weeks. So going from 50 to 100 is a is a really uh, a small baby step, I think, uh, compared to what the original proposal was. But that being said, I guess uh, uh, in, in not hearing a lot of support from the from the commission itself, uh, I would like to re respectfully withdraw my amendment to the original to my original motion. I would be happy to read the uh, or make the original motion again without an amendment. Okay, um, Commissioner Lane, you agree to that? Yep. Oh, you're. I do agree. Okay. Uh, and, and just a. Madam Chair, just last word to the department. Well, I, I would encourage the department when you look at quotas, especially on the B tags, to look at increasing opportunities for hunting, for public hunting in this area, especially when it comes to cows, until we uh, get the bigger plan in place next year. So, and that being said, uh, Madam Chair, I move the Fish and Wildlife Commission adopt the amendments to the license permit type quotas and quota ranges and hunting district legal descriptions as presented by the department in this cover sheet and accompanying amendment sheet. Second. Okay, Commissioner Tabor, second. Okay, I am just gonna go to a vote. I think we've had ample discussion. So all those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Okay, it is, I think what, I, what I'd like to do is go ahead, Brian, and do the city of Lewistown Urban Deer Management Plan, and then we'll take a half hour lunch after that. Very good, Madam Chair. Um, uh, as, as the commission has, uh, has seen previously, um, uh, cities do have the ability uh, under statute to come to the commission and uh, the commission is authorized to provide them uh, with approval of uh, urban deer management plans. Um, urban deer management plans often uh, take a variety of, of different approaches um, this one is uh, the city of Lewiston, um, and it was approved uh, by their city council uh, in July, July 18th. Um, they took uh, public comment at that time, um, did not uh, receive much internally. Uh, we've received just a couple of comments uh, through through uh, our process. Um, the, uh, the comments were largely critical of uh, the lethal removal of deer within the urban urban areas. Uh, however, the city is uh, intends to move forward with this if approved by the commission. Uh, it's not through a, a hunting process. It would still be through the annual quota uh, that is approved in a biennial process by the commission uh, as part of the, the overall approval package. So they can't exceed the overall uh, uh, quota that has been established. Um, they do intend to uh, to, as they encounter these animals, if they're trapped and, you, and uh, humanely dispatched, they would be uh, CWD tested. And then the intent is to turn it through over to the Montana Food Bank Network uh, for human consumption. Um, and I'd certainly be glad to try to answer any questions if the commission has it. Does anyone have any questions? Um, Commissioner Siebel. Madam Chair, I move that the Fish and Wildlife Commission approve the City of Lewistown Urban Deer Management Action Plan. Second. Okay, seconded by Commissioner Walsh. All right, we, um, any questions or comments before I go out to public comment? Okay. 
Hunter, do we have any public commenters? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if there's anyone online, could they please raise their hand? Seeing none, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. All right, um, with no other comments, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carries. All right, it is 1230. We will reconvene at one if everyone thinks a half an hour is long enough for lunch. Okay, perfect. We'll reconvene at one.
All right. All right, we will uh, reconvene the meeting and we'll go with the land and water on the um, agenda. Thank you, Director. We ready? Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commission members. Bill Shank for the Land and Water Unit. I've got two items for you today. Uh, the first of which is a new water lease on Rock Creek. Uh, early last year, you approved the renewal of a water lease on Rock Creek near Garrison, Montana, on the Clark Fork. Uh, this is on the Yellowstone River, uh, a tributary to the Yellowstone River, uh, just downstream from Mulherrin Creek. Um, the proposed lessor on this is the Point of Rocks Ranch. Uh, we've been working with them, our staff has been working with them for some time to develop a uh, to develop this lease. Um, this is a, it's a unique opportunity in that um, the, the ranch is looking to move uh, its irrigation water down to the main stream of the Yellowstone. Uh, they're working with the conservation district to, district to replace uh, the irrigation water that is coming out of Rock and Stoughton Creeks. Stoughton being a, a small tributary to Rock Creek. Um, three of the water rights involved in this would actually come out of Rock Creek and four directly out of Stoughton Creek. Um, the fishery benefit of this, well, there was 10, 10 years ago, the department made a substantial investment and removed a, uh, an old culvert, um, a bad culvert and a non-functional fish ladder and placed a, a series of step pools for fish to be able to migrate uh, upstream, downstream. The um, However, uh, due to the irrigation withdrawals, the stream gets very low in the summer and fall. Uh, it doesn't dry up completely, but this would give us an opportunity to keep more water in there, um, help with rearing and migration of fish. And it, it is also a, uh, it is a, a Yellowstone cut float trout stream. Um, we anticipate uh, though the, the water rights total 8.73 CFS on paper, we estimate that it would keep around two CFS in the stream through the uh, summer and early fall months. Uh, the price on this lease is, uh, it, it's extremely cheap um, when judged against the market for water. It's $10,000 for 30 years, which, which is, you know, right close to it, almost entirely a donation on the part of Point of Rocks Ranch. We're putting some money into it because they are um, investing in some infrastructure to get that irrigation water from the Yellowstone onto the irrigated ground. Uh, that water savings and, and the water savings associated with that investment will um, allow us to enter a lease for 30 years. Kind of a unique situation here in that the environmental assessment, we do not do the environmental assessment. The last thing that takes place is that these then go to the DNRC to go through their water rate change process. During that process, the DNRC does an EA. There's also an opportunity for other water right holders who feel they could be adversely affected to object. Um, but you did see there was there was um, some public comment on, that came into the commission and that was all favorable. Uh, that's all I have for that one. And and um, unless you have any questions. Any questions from the commission? Uh, Madam Chair, do you want us to uh, motion one at a time or would you want to? Yeah, let's do it one at a time, but uh, I think we could probably go out for comment together on it. Let's, I'll take a motion on this. Madam Chair. Commissioner Walsh. Uh, thank you. First, I want to um, recognize I'm familiar with this area and this, these tributaries and uh, what a tremendous opportunity. And I, I want to thank the uh, Point of Rocks Ranch and also a couple of our staff people who I understand worked on this, Andy Brumman and Scott Opitz. Um, way to go. Um, I move the Fish and Wildlife Commission approve the water right lease agreement with Point of Rocks Ranch LLC and direct 
uh, FWP staff to make application to DNRC to temporarily temporarily change the irrigation water rights to in-stream flow for a period of 30 years in accordance with the water right lease agreement. Sorry, I second. second. Okay, Commissioner Tabor, second. Um, Commissioner Byer. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. I just wanted to echo uh, Commissioner Walsh's thanks to the staff and mention uh, in particular, Carol Endicott, who has been a fisheries biologist and one of the advocates working on the uh, Rock Creek for many, many years. She's retiring, I believe, at the end of the month. And I just wanted to call her out and thank you, thank her for her years of service. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Okay, all right. Uh, Mr. Shank, if you wanna go ahead with the next one and then I'll go out to public comment after we uh, go through the next Certainly, one. Certainly, Madam Chair and Commissioners. The second one is a, an addition, a proposed addition to the Big Lake Wildlife Management Area, which is northwest of Billings. Uh, a slight correction from your cover sheet. Um, the surveyor made a late adjustment. We found out that is the proposal is actually 116.3 acres. Um, this would be a fee acquisition. We've worked very closely with the uh, neighboring landowner. Um, Big Lake, uh, it provides uh, tremendous habitat for both nesting and migration of waterfowl. Um, this would certainly expand that opportunity and it, and it gets a lot of waterfowl hunting. This would expand that opportunity, but there's also a, 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 a management um, thrust to this proposal as well. Currently, um, it, it is private land on the very south end of the of the wildlife management area. This area is seasonally seasonally inundated with water. There is a fence that goes under that uh, wet area that is exposed. Um, you know, it often falls down. You get trespass cattle. This ish, this proposal came from working with that adjoining landowner who would very much like to get the fence moved up and the property boundary moved up uh, onto dry land. It is, uh, it is, you know, very much to the benefit of both the department and that landowner, uh, T-Bar J Ranch. Um, because it is inundated, because it is so wet much of the year, the appraised price is $93,000 and we are proposing, uh, the agreement is to pay that appraised price. There's an additional $15,000 of fencing investment as well. Uh, the last thing I wanna say, and this is just slightly off script, but uh, uh, Mike Ruggles and the folks at Region 5 have, um, have asked that we could recognize Jim Hansen in this, pro in this process. Jim was a longtime migratory bird coordinator. Uh, he was um, apparently frequented that area, took people out there uh, and uh, the region has proposed that we, should you accept this proposal and pass this, that they would like to commemorate Jim there uh, on site and in fact, recognize this as the Jim Hansen addition to the Big Lake Wildlife Management Area. Okay. Is there any questions or comments from anyone? Uh, Commissioner Siebel. Madam Chair, I, I move that the, well, first of all, I'd like to say uh, before I make a motion here that, uh, you know, this obviously is a really important wildlife management area and I don't get out there very often, but I know a lot of people that do. So really important in Region 5, especially for Billings. And I really appreciate the efforts of Region 5 and the department to, to get this extension done. It's something we looked at, obviously approved preliminarily at the commission before. It makes a lot of sense and, and I'm excited. I didn't know Mr. Hansen either, but uh, I've heard a lot of good things about him and, and uh, understand he passed away in, in October. And this is going to be a great memorial for him. So with that, I'd like to make a motion. And I move uh, that the Fish and Wildlife Commission approve FWP purchase the 116.3 acres to be added to Big Lake Wildlife Management Area as proposed. And that the Fish and Wildlife uh, Commission identify the addition officially as the Jim Hansen addition to the Big Lake Wildlife Management Area. I second. Okay. Commissioner Tabor seconded. Okay, any other comments before I go out for public comment? Okay, 
First, I'll ask any of the regional offices if you have anyone present who would like to comment to either one of these motions. Okay, yes, do we have any um, public commenters? We do, Madam Chair, uh, Clayton Elliott. Okay. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Happy to be with you today. I heard your discussion of the weather. It's actually a balmy 34 degrees in Butte, America today. The snow is melting on the streets. I don't know what all of this cold weather you're talking about is, but here in, in, in the center of the universe, it's quite warm. But uh, just a moment to thank both Commissioner Byworth and Commissioner Waller. Obviously, Commissioner Byworth, I've known for some time. Commissioner Waller, it's been a real pleasure to get to know you and work with you on fisheries. I know that we often are a lot lower key than some of our wildlife companions and our issues are a little bit quiet, but that does not mean that they are less complex or hard to get your mind around. So thanks to both Commissioner Byworth and Commissioner Waller for working with both of you. Just wanted to stand up and I've talked before about these water right lease agreements. The Rock Creek in Paradise Valley is a, a great opportunity. I'm going to truncate my usual spiel on these. I mean, I think these are win-win scenarios where we can keep production agriculture on the landscape and, and make them whole. We can work within the prior appropriation legal doctrine to uh, improve fisheries benefit in a, in a legal and durable way within the water rights system. And this one is particularly important for recruitment for Yellowstone Cutthroat. It's a uh, critical spawning tributary, but that recruitment into making fishing better, not only for the creek, uh, but also that upper Yellowstone reach. So I, I just think that there's a multi-dimension um, benefits here. I think the ten thousand dollar price tag is is beyond more than reasonable. As Mr. Shank mentioned, it's a great deal for Montana's fishery. So I uh, urge your support for that. And also would thank Commissioner Byworth for calling out Carol Endicott. What a great champion for Yellowstone Cutthroat in uh, South Central Montana. And I've worked with her for a number of years. Uh, she will be sorely missed, but her legacy will go on for generations. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Madam Chair, we have Michael Bias. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Commissioners, good afternoon. My name is Mike Bias, B I A S. I'm Executive Director of the Fishing Outfitters Association of Montana. And on behalf of our Board of Directors and over a thousand professional guide and outfitter members of FOAM, I'm here to strongly to urge you to strongly support the Rock Creek Water Right Lease Agreement and urge you to improve this important project as it provides, as you know, an opportunity to restore and protect in-stream flow in and, and, and both creeks, Rock Creek and Stockton Slough, and uh, benefit, for, to the benefit of resident and migratory trout and fish on the upper Yellowstone. Also, we too would like to thank Commissioners Byorth and Waller for their, their service and dedication to their work as commissioners. Um, we very much appreciated working with them and, and we're surely gonna miss them. Uh, certainly, I think as well as the, the Fish and Wildlife Resources in Montana, we'll miss them as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have the Montana Wildlife Federation. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Madam Chair, members of the commission, for the record, Marcus Strange representing the Montana Wildlife Federation. And we stand in support of uh, both of these um, items. Uh, we're very excited about uh, adding uh, the WMA edition. Um, as was noted, this is a great opportunity for um, hunters and bird watchers, as well as for our uh, FWP employees to better manage the resource. And then um, obviously the, the water right lease is an incredible opportunity and we're very grateful to the landowner for um, their willingness to, as was noted, essentially donate this to us. So uh, a hearty um, support for both of these projects. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, I don't see any other hands raised. Okay. I will just ask the regions one more time just to make sure I don't miss anyone. Okay. We will start with the, um, any other comments from anyone? 
Okay. The Rock Creek Water Rice lease, right lease uh, motion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay, the Big Lake WMA edition. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carried. All right. Thank you, Mr. Shank. And thank you. Thank you. move on to uh, uh, Ms. Stockwell now. Yeah, Madam Chair, just real quick, I, I do want to thank you for noticing Mr. Jim Hansen on that. I had the honor and pleasure of meeting him and working with him. So uh, for those that know, he, he actually big time in waterfall and he passed away opening day of, of waterfall season this year. So pretty interesting individual. Good afternoon members. For the record, Hope Stockwell, administrator of the Parks and Outdoor Recreation Division. We're starting first with the Pardon me. Got the wrong notes pulled up. I've got it. We're starting first with the commercial use permit fee rule renewal for fishing access sites and wildlife management areas. Just for some background, FWP has two commercial use permit fee rules. One applies to FASs and WMAs in front of you today. The other applies to state parks. We are, as part of the reorganization, going through an effort to consolidate those into one rule proposal. We'll need more runway and we'll be expecting to implement that for calendar year 2024. So before you today is simply a renewal of the existing commercial use permit fee rule for FASs and WMAs, which is set to expire at the end of this year uh, as a placeholder until we get to that point where we have the consolidated rule, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, it was, I would entertain a motion. Commissioner Siebel. Madam Chair, I move the Fish and Wildlife Commission renew the existing commercial use permit fee rule for fishing access sites and wildlife management areas with no changes for the 2023 calendar year. Second. Okay, uh, Commissioner Byer, second. Okay, any questions or comments before I go out to public comment? Okay. Anyone in the regional offices who would like to comment? Okay. Um, Hunter, do we have any public commenters? Seeing none, Madam Chair. Okay. All those in favor of renewing the commercial use permit fee rule, um, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. All right, we'll move on to the Madison River Work Group recommendation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, Hope Stockwell for the Parks and Outdoor Recreation Division. In June, the commission directed FWP, as you will recall, to conduct public scoping on recommendations put forth by the Madison River Work Group related to managing commercial and non-commercial use on the river. Pending the results, the commission decided in August to stay a commercial use cap that was set to go into effect in January for the Madison to a later date. And that is either upon adoption of an allocation method for the cap or a comprehensive river plan and rule package. The public scoping period on the work group's recommendations opened August 15th and closed October 14th. It included five public hearings Locations included Bozeman, Ennis, West Yellowstone, Butte, and then we also had an online offering via Zoom. And I wanna stop and say thanks to Deb O'Neill, Charlie Sperry, and many staff from Region 3 who helped support the scoping process and the meetings, they did a great job. FWP received comments from 554 people each person had the opportunity to provide a separate comment on each of the recommendations, the way that it was organized online. And that resulted in 917 total comments. Of those just shy of half were related to the recommendations on Bear Trap Canyon, which were overwhelmingly opposed to those recommendations. I will strongly note that Bear Trap Canyon's administration is in the hands of the Bureau of Land Management and is not FWP's jurisdiction. 
We have forwarded those comments for consideration to the BLM in their own administrative prop processes. I'm gonna set the bear trap comments aside for the rest of this summary of the comments that came in and focus on the other themes that we found. And Charlie Sperry deserves the credit for uh, going through with fine tooth comb and, and working on these. The first theme pertained to capping the total amount of commercial use on the river. There was general support from commercial and non-commercial users for a commercial cap, but there was disagreement on the best way to allocate the available trips. There was both support and opposition to basing the cap on the highest use from 2019 and 2020, as it's previously been established. Supporters viewed that as the way to best ensure commercial use doesn't increase further, but opponents were concerned, or critics, I should maybe say, were concerned that too much time has passed since then and that the cap doesn't reflect new businesses that have started or expanded in the meantime and don't have historical use recorded in 2019 or 2020. Supporters of the work group recommendations said they would, um, that the recommendations would allow new and smaller businesses to start or expand their operations by acquiring trips through the transferability provisions, uh, leasing perhaps or purchasing or receiving forfeited trips from those with allocated trips they were not going to use. But critics expressed concern that the cost of leasing or purchasing the trips could be prohibitive and they did not actually expect many trips to be forfeited. There was also strong concern about the monetization of this public resource in this process and sentiment that commercial use associated with public resources is a privilege. And those commenters reflected that a business profits should come really from the service they provide rather than the um, money made from selling or leasing a trip. There was general support for requiring watercraft rental delivery businesses to obtain a permit and record their use, but there was less support for restricting those businesses to high density zones of the river. And then regarding non-commercial use, there was both support and opposition to requiring non-commercial users to have a float permit with slightly more people opposed, it was noted. A common sentiment though, was that the department should acquire more data on non-commercial use, um, but that a permit system was unnecessary or overly burdensome to get to that data collection piece. Um, many people did acknowledge in those comments that unmanaged non-commercial use could lead to undesirable resource impacts or a degraded experience. And then there was support for a comprehensive recreation management plan for the river. In other sort of miscellaneous items, some people expressed concern that restricting commercial or non-commercial use on the Madison was, would result in displacement from that river to activity on other non-regulated rivers. Some commenters suggested resident only days on the Madison and or a rest rotation system for commercial users that they would not be allowed to operate on certain days or sections of the river as an alternative. There were more people opposed than supporting the recommendation for vessel requirements. They say it favored angling over other types of use and that there could be a better approach that would emphasize more communication and river etiquette instead. But lastly, overall, the theme, regardless of the use type or the commenter, many people express taking care of the resources is the highest priority to ensure they're not overly impacted by recreational use. So Madam Chair, that is my summary of the comments. All of the comments in their raw form are available for viewing on the commission website, along with the thematic summary that Mr. Sperry prepared. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions, comments? Commissioner Byer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this uh, process has been going on for now 11 years. Uh, and just in the four years that I've been on the commission and deeply engaged in this issue, there's been well over uh, 10,000 comments and another thousand this go round. Uh, we've, we've been through a uh, potential rulemaking process in 2011 that the commission said we better hold back and study it more. We had a negotiated rulemaking committee that studied the issue and the commission said, we better hold back and uh, not move forward. We entered into a major rulemaking process, including a, you know, a very thorough treatment of the data and a treatment of a public comment 
And again, and we passed a package of regulations which have subsequently been uh, rescinded. We had a Madison River work group uh, that dedicated, I would guess, well over a thousand hours of their time, including uh, Commissioner Walsh's chair, to uh, to advance the, the a set of recommendations. And those recommendations, uh, it, it's interesting if you look back through the you know, well over 11 year history, you'll see that the themes that have been presented by the by the uh, work group were, have been voiced and were very well refined. Uh, I just learned yesterday that uh, the, there was a proposal on the part of the department and I'd love for uh, Ms. Stockwell to, to talk about this, was to send it to the legislature for an interim committee to do research. I will tell you and, and you know, any, Anybody in the fisheries division is welcome to correct me if I'm wrong, but there is not the kind of data we have on the Madison and its fishery, whether it's biological or social or a creel census, whether it's a uh, research, there is not a fishery like the Madison that has been so thoroughly researched. And there's literally nothing that the, the interim committee is gonna come up with that we haven't already come up with. I think in the long run, if we if we rely on a, a, a legislative interim committee to study this, here's the timeline of how that works. They pass a bill or not during the legislature to direct this to uh, an interim committee. And that interim committee then meets over the course of the following year uh, and then makes recommendations to the legislature. So at the very best, we would see something that would happen within two years. Uh, but I've seen enough uh, interim committees in my career uh, to know that it's not likely that they will come up with a better approach. They've already given the commission the authority to move forward. Uh, we have all the data we could possibly want, uh, more than just about any other fishery, I think, uh, in Montana, if not elsewhere. Uh, it's really time to act. And so for that reason, and uh, going into this meeting with the uncertainty i saw it as an informational item and yet there was a uh alternatives that said the commission could make a, a motion so i drafted one up yesterday and i sent it out late last night so i apologize for the late minute but again this has been going on a long time and i think it's time the commission shows some courage and leadership and just act so for that reason madam chair i'd move the fish and wildlife commission draft rules on the madison river recreation rules as stated in the Madison River work group recommendations, FWP staff assessment for commission dated June 1, 22. However, I would exclude the commercial watercraft rental delivery permit and non-commercial bear trap canyon flow permit, which bear more consideration and were not supported by public comment. Is there a second to the motion? Is there a second to the motion? All right, one more time. Is there anyone who would like to second the motion? Okay. Um, due to lack of a second, the motion fails. Is there, uh, Casey, you had your hand up before? Let me unmute. <clears throat> I'm not supporting this amendment at this time uh, it, 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 for a couple of reasons. I've had a, a couple of weeks here to uh, consider the dialogue that we had at our uh, November 30th meeting and, um, and the, you know, uh, 75 pages of summarized comments that we received. Now, I agree with Commissioner Byworth that this has been long and drawn out. And I think outfitter Dave Cumline down in Bozeman told me he was involved in looking at this issue on the Madison 40 years ago. And I think that um, accentuates that um, despite analyzing this a bunch, um, it's still a very far reaching and complex issue. And and, um, and it has, what, what we do on the Madison will have ramifications for other major rivers in the state. And, um, and you know, what we learned in our meeting last summer was that this implementing the recommendations of the uh, work group would also have a, a 
three quarters of a, a million dollar implication on the budget for the department. And that could range up and down depending on the permit system requirements, but I think it's probably at least half a million dollars that's currently not budgeted in the proposed budget for 2023. I think um, the other thing I've heard independently in, and this has been recently, but from outfitters who are concerned that if we were to implement the 2019 to 20 cap, uh, based cap um, today for the 23 season, that it could be very challenging for those outfitters who've already booked a bunch of dates in the um, 2023 season. So I, you know, uh, I'm used to moving more quickly in the business world than um, than we have with uh, with this issue and some other issues. But I, I was persuaded by uh, Hope Stockwell and and Deb O'Neill and others who have spoken to about the importance of doing this interim study and getting a study bill through the legislature and and uh, following this with the bipartisan environment environmental quality council i'm committed to spending uh whatever time necessary to make sure we actually do that um, over the coming weeks um, and again i think um, given the broad array of feedback we've received what a legislative solution will do for us is collect more information from the public and and also get um, the Montana State Legislature involved uh, in backing whatever solution we, we find for the Madison and other major rivers in our state. Thanks. And thank just one more time, if I can thank the work group for the many, many hours that were put into this issue last year, I think um, I think we had some key wins, uh, you know, reversing the rest rotation rule. And uh, I think we'll see some improvements to the fishing access sites on the Madison and hopefully see the river ambassador program implemented this summer. Um, so uh, thanks to all who are involved in this. Yeah, thank you, um, Vice Chair Tabor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> Commissioner Byorth, yeah. you know, I just really appreciate the level of passion and, and uh, commitment that you had to this. And, and I, I can fully understand your level of, of frustration when you've worked so hard for so long to try to effectuate change and it doesn't come about because I have plenty of examples in my life where I've tried to do the same thing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't view this as a, a, a not ever, just a not now. And, and from my perspective, the reason why I couldn't support seconding this is I really felt after the scoping and this is why I wanted to do the scoping was that the bigger broader public really in fact did weigh in and and if there was a flaw relative to what we did prior to that is it was a select group of people that was really heavily biased in one way in terms of what might be benefiting them directly instead of it being a real comprehensive look from all different constituencies and as you've often commented in so many of our other uh, promulgations getting that balanced look in everybody's perspective is super important especially something that's so precedent setting like this and so i'd like to hear from commissioner siebel after i speak because he had actually served on one of these interim committees and and I think I, I actually hold a lot of hope that something really valuable is going to come out of this. I like the fact that a it's bipartisan and B that it really looks at things comprehensively because I don't think the mechanism of the commission or maybe the way we've done it up to this point really has the wherewithal to do it in a fashion that perhaps it can be done through this, this up, this proposed vehicle. Um, but I don't think that the issue is going to die. It can't die because we still have a lot of hard work to do to protect resources and make sure that we allocate fairly. Um, and you have my commitment that we'll continue to just keep our eye on it and make sure that we make good, sensible decisions about this that are fair for all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Byerth had his hand up, so I'll let him go first. Oh, you are muted. I was just going to say if uh, Commissioner Siebel wants to go ahead, I'll defer till after okay. him. Okay. Commissioner Siebel. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a, in response to Vice Chair Tabor's comments, uh, first I'd like to thank Commissioner Byerth for, you know, for for making the motion, and I agree. This is you know it's, it's obvious to us all that it's been going on a long time, and I think that's testimony to how complicated the issue is, and really more importantly, how complicated the solutions are to that issue, and and, and trying not to pick winners and losers, and trying to do what's right for the resource and for the uh, for the users. So uh, I think it's testimony to that, and and I will say. Uh, to, to Vice Chair Tabor's point, I did serve three interims uh, on the Environmental Quality Council. I was a, a, a citizen appointee, and it was a it was a very very thorough and very thoughtful process. Uh, uh, Pulp and I, I think we're, we we overlapped and spent some time together on the EQC. Uh, so very very thoughtful process. A lot of you know they're different topics, but they're generally are, are you know a handful of big uh, big topics that they that they investigate. Very thorough, and of course the legislative involvement is really important part of that. And, and uh, I can say over the three interims, you know, we didn't solve all the problems, but I think it's a, I, I think it's a good process, and I think it's the right process for this, and and that's uh, also why I did not not support uh, taking action today, and I think it should go to to a more legislative solution. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Byers. I uh, appreciate uh, both uh, Vice Chair Tabor and Commissioner Siebel's uh, reflections and support. Uh, my greatest fear is that. Uh, that we're, we're playing Nero fiddling while Rome burns. And I say that because I've tracked these populations personally for over 30 years. And the fish population is showing signs of exploitation pressure. In another five years, if the population doesn't indeed crash or continue the way it's going, uh, I think it's incumbent upon the commission to uh, take action. And I will uh, hold you to it. Your promise to continue to focus on this, as will others. Uh, I think the most important public comment over those thousands and thousands of comments that we've received is put the resource first. And I think we've failed to do that today. Is there any other comments? Okay. This was an informational on our agenda, so there will not be public comments on it. Um, okay, so the last thing that we have on our agenda is public comment on items not on the agenda. Do we have anyone in the regional offices who would like to comment on anything we did not have on the agenda? Madam Chair, we do have one commenter in Region 2. Okay. Madam Chair, Commissioners, Director Warshak, Mark Cook with Wolves of the Rockies, Commissioner Waller, thanks for your patience, and I wish you well in your new location and in your future endeavors. Now, Commissioner Byroth, it's our time with you. Your tour of duty is coming to an end. Wolves of the Rockies would like to thank you for your commitment to Montana's wildlife. You will be missed severely by all the non-consumptive community and the many thousands of people who support and follow Wolves of the Rockies. We hope you will continue to stay engaged with wolf and wildlife issues. And with your permission, a nod of the head would work. I would like to read the award that we are giving you on behalf of our board and all our supporters. In recognition and appreciation for your courage, knowledge, dedication, and commitment to science-based wolf management, we are eternally grateful. I will send this to you tomorrow. I just want you to take a look at it, if you don't mind. And lastly, have a nice holiday, everybody, and I thank I thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of all the people that support Wolves of the Rockies. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Byerth, you can comment if you'd like. Uh, thanks, Mark. I'm, I'm grateful for the honor and uh, it, the honor has been mine to work with you and, and all the folks who care so much about wildlife. Are there any other public commenters in the regional offices? Okay. Go ahead. 
Hunter, do we have anyone online? We do, Madam Chair. Um, we can start with uh, Laura Howe. Okay. All right, go ahead. Hi, thank you, Madam Commissioner, for the opportunity to speak. And I'm here to talk about the uh, Madison River item that was on the agenda. And I just want to give a little synopsis of the overwhelming opposition to the bear trap non-commercial um, portion okay. of the... And this this is for uh, items not on the agenda. And from what... So um, if you have you, other comments. I would like to speak on the item that was on the agenda for the Madison River Work Group. It's on the agenda. It says public comment is available. May I proceed? Go ahead. Just public comment. Thank you. Um, I'll keep this very short. I just wanted to note that of the bear trap section comments, not almost 90% of the responses were in opposition and almost 50% of all the comments received for the entire work group recommendation was in opposition to bear trap. There was approximately 20 to 30% of the responses in each section that was not the bear trap section. Approximately 20 to 30% of those responses were in opposition to bear trap, I'm assuming because people were just confused about where to enter their comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Can I get a clarification before we take any more comments? A bear trap is not under our jurisdiction. It's under BLM. Am I correct on that? Yes, that yes, is chair. correct, Madam Chair. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, do we have any other commenters? We do, Madam Chair. Uh, Karen O. Okay. Star six to unmute. Am I unmuted now? Yes, you are. Go ahead. Um, I'm out hiking on public land. I just want to thank uh, Commissioner Byarth for all his support, his ethics, his morals, and the fact that he is the biologist on this committee and has advocated for wildlife and especially our gray wolf. And it has not gone unnoticed among thousands and thousands of people. And you are so appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have Julie Argyle. Did that sound okay? Okay. <clears throat> okay, um, star six. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Hi, this is Julie Argyle, Madam Chair, everyone there. I also wanted to just call in and thank Pat from the bottom of my heart for everything that he's done. Pat, after the meeting um, in August, I was able to talk to you outside the meeting. I don't know if you remember out in the parking lot, we discussed a few things and I love your passion. Thank you for listening to those of us who are, I don't know that I would say the minority because I think we're above the minority and just listening to the voices of all the people that matter. Um, Jana Waller, welcome to Utah. I guess that's where you're coming to, I'm here. Hopefully you can come here and I don't know, do some good things here also. But thank you so much, Pat, for your passion and thank you for taking a public comment and good luck in your future adventures. Thank you. Madam Chair, the Montana Wildlife Federation. Okay, go ahead. Madam Chair, members of the commission, um, I really appreciate the meeting we've had today and i just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you to each and every one of you um, i've really appreciated the last year of work um, that you all have done um, you've been collaborative you've done uh, really good work and i just wanted to say thank you for my myself and, and all of our members we are we're greatly appreciative um, and you know we we can't we can't say enough good things about Commissioner Waller and Commissioner Byarth. Both of you were amazing commissioners. We're going to miss you both very much. Um, you know, Commissioner Byarth, we'll get to keep bugging you because you're not going anywhere. Uh, Commissioner Waller, you're getting off easy by moving to Utah. So uh, good luck chasing those big mule deer down there. Um, and again, thank you all and happiest of holidays to you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Okay, do we have any other commenters? We do, we have a few left. Um, yeah. We can go with Mary. 
star six, go ahead. Yes, hello. Um, thank you, Commissioner Byworth, for your service and your commitment to wildlife and public lands in Montana. You made impartial science-based decisions in the best interest of all and not just for a select few. You will be greatly missed. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, Casey York. Go ahead. Okay, you need to unmute again. How are you? There you go. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, Commissioners, I'm Casey York, President of Trout Free Montana and Trout Free Montana Public Lands. On behalf of our Board of Directors and constituents, we want to thank Commissioner Byworth for his professionalism, expertise, objectivity, and modesty, including his lack of reference to his biology degree which understandably influenced him and the much needed look to the science and his applicable questions thereof. Commissioner Byworth became the lone wolf or close commonly in his vote advocating for ethics and science-based wildlife management. That position took courage and demonstrated his integrity. He is well-spoken, shared personal experiences and spoke from the heart. It was obvious he held his responsibility in high regard as a Montana public servant, and although it had to be exhausting, it never waned. Commissioner Byworth served as a reminder wildlife belongs to all under the pub public trust doctrine, or in my cultural belief, wildlife belong to no one, but need equal representation. Commissioner Byworth will be missed. We hope his attributes as a commissioner set the bar high for his replacement. Commissioner Waller, I'm sorry we never got to get better acquainted and wish you the best. It's not easy being a female on issues involving wildlife. Thank you for your service, and I apologize for my noisy dog in the background. Happy holidays to y'all. Thank you. Okay, we have Rod Bullis next. Okay. All right, there we go. Um, star six. You hear me okay? We can, go ahead. Yeah, this is another, uh, thank you. It's Rod Bullis from the Helena Hunters and Anglers Association. And I, uh, as I said at one of the meetings, this commission's the most important commission in my life. And I appreciate every one of you. I wanna express a couple of reasons why I really wish the best and appreciate Commissioner Waller and Byworth. Whenever I would contact you, you got back right away. There was no dilly-dallying around. And when I would ask you, what can I provide to help you make an informed decision? You answered that question. So I appreciate the relationship of trust and respect that we built. Uh, region two and region three are the greatest areas for the hunter, Helena hunters and anglers in participation. And the fact that you represented the average hunter and angler, you know, that really uh, cuts a wide swath with a man like me. So thank you and the very best to you. And Merry Christmas. That's it. Thank you. Okay, next we have Allison D. All right, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Allison Dahlman. I extend my sincerest appreciation and respect to Pat Byworth. You represented actual biological and current scientific facts in your comments and votes on wildlife, including endangered species. The remaining wildlife and I thank you. You courageously spoke truth not caving to special interests. You have faced challenges with honesty, dignity, and honor. I will miss hearing logic and reason in the following meeting. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Okay, next we have Sylvia. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair and 
Sylvia, I'm a Montanan, and I want to thank uh, Pat Boyer for your essential work and basing it on science. It is much, much appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, next we have Kim Beam. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Always a plus. Hey, uh, Chair and Commission, I just, uh, I, I, I speak for, uh, um, I don't have to speak for anybody. I'll speak for myself first. Miss Waller, Jana, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to talk to you, get to know you. Um, and Pat, as always, sir, I can't say anything more than everybody has other than my respect for you, sir, is it's insurmountable. And I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your non partisan talk. And I, uh, I, I respect anything. I wish you all the best, sir, going forward. And I hope we can keep in touch and keep, keep, keep trying for a while. Thank you. Um, thank you. Y'all have a very, very happy holiday. Thanks so much, Jana. You'll want that steak, man. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. And next we have Kin. What's your name? Hello, Ken Sine again. Um, I just, I, I hate to belabor an issue, but I would like to speak to the Madison River scoping uh, concepts. Um, not really necessarily in relation to scoping, but the entire decades long process. Um, not all aspects of Madison River uh, management or commercial use are complicated. Uh, my big theme has always been and continues to be downstream of Gray Cliff fishing access site things are completely different. The issue has always been crowding and the amount of commercial use. That issue does not exist, does not exist downstream of Gray Cliff. It exists even less downstream of Milwaukee Fishing Access Site. Um, some, some concepts that have been neglected throughout the decades are focusing on quantity of use, type of use, and in particular, region, region of use. And once again, downstream of Gray Cliff, things are completely different. Downstream of Milwaukee, once again, even more different. Um, I would like to, uh, I just would like to emphasize that considering that area as something different than the area where we do have crowding issues uh, and do not have so much commercial issues could easily benefit the public, the economy, and frankly, the resource. Under the current recommendations by the working group, we would actually be eliminating the type of service that I've offered for decades, did cut back. Okay, thank you for your comments. Um, thank you for listening very much. And once again, thank you very much to Pat Byerworth. I don't want to neglect uh, the, the compliments that he's been getting. <laughs> All right, we have Hunter. The hand has gone down. I believe at this time that we have all public comment made. Okay. All right. I will open it up to any of the commissioners if you have anything to add before we adjourn. Okay. I again want to thank uh, Commissioner Byerth and Commissioner Waller. I'm very glad that we got to know each other and uh, I also, I don't know if Hunter's still on here, but I want to thank her for always. She's just great to work with. Um, it's been successful meeting and I just want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas. And if there's no other business meeting is yeah. adjourned. Oh, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Waller has ran. Yep, oh. go ahead. Oh, thank you so much. I just wanted to say thanks to everybody. Um, I know that earlier, I thank the commission. Um, all of you have been gracious and patient with me, and I so appreciate that. And just a big thank you to everyone in, inside the director's office as well. Um, many a calls were made over my term uh, asking for clarification and understanding, and everybody's been just so fantastic. So thank you so much for all the kind words and for the friendships that I sincerely hope that we'll stay in touch. Thank you. I, th I don't know if Hunter was on there when I when I thanked her, but thank you very much for your help. You're very, very pivotal part of making this a success. So, 
Thank you. I appreciate it. And I'm sorry for the technical difficulties there at the end. Oh, that's all right. Things happen. <laughs> so, all right. Well, Merry Christmas, everyone. And meeting Merry Christmas. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone.